So we're good. We got the cameras rolling, got the mics pumping. How you feeling today, Jabro? Y'all feeling great, man. I'm, how you feeling? Alhamdulillah, man. Juma Mubarak, bro. Juma Mubarak. Right. Mr. Shadi, Juma Mubarak. Juma Mubarak. Yes, <laughs> yes. Today is a blessed day because we know it's Friday, the best of days. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and give us the great light or the nude until next Friday, you know? Mm. I mean, I mean. Um, you know, we have a special guest with us today. Took a the drive wasn't too bad up here, right? It was You were asleep half the time, so <laughs> you won't even know. <laughs> I was awake. I drove for you. I brought you out home. What you tell I'm the captain. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the drive was good. This is our first time in Delaware. Delaware, right. You know, usually when I'm here is just to get bean pods, we in and out. But uh no, we're here for a little bit. We got Imer Shadi with us today, so we thank you, you know. Came in. The Shot line. the DM. Look, we just had the episode on the DMs, how to slide in them and, right. and, and get in and out. <laughs> Shot the DM. We're like, hey, want to record? Boom. We need to start, like, actually, we need to start, like, uh, giving classes on how to yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, a DM tutorial. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, especially <laughs> young bucks, you know what I'm saying? But now we appreciate you, Brother Shadi, coming out today, you know, inviting us over here to your city, your community. We just had Jamal with you. It was awesome. Mashallah. Mm-hmm. Packed. The brothers was praying in the streets. We praying outside. <laughs> <laughs> Philadelphia all over again, huh? Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, now, uh, without further ado, we have uh, Imam Brother Shadid here with us, mashallah, father, an imam, a leader in the community. So this is the first imam we've had. So um, for the audience, thank you guys for reaching out and letting us know what you need because we mm-hmm. take you guys seriously mm-hmm. and our craft. So we went out and we found the best. So, <laughs> so but before we get into that, we you know we gotta you got we gotta do what we gotta do. We have a tendency of forgetting to start the intro, so okay. we we want to make sure we don't do that this time. You ready? Let's go, baby. Three. What's going on, everybody? Oh, Count down, bro. Oh, Chill out. Right. Stay in little your little lane. Haze, little haze, <laughs> all right, go ahead. Go ahead. Three, two, one. What's going on, everybody? This is Jabril Salam and Muhammad Hassan, and you are listening to the Young and Muslim Podcast. Assalamu alaikum. Mer, 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 mer. Welcome back to all the old listeners and. The new listeners. Yes, marhaban. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Brother Shadi, without further ado, you know, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell them a little bit more about you. Just high level because we're going to dive in. But, you know, go ahead and do this honor, brother. Uh, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for having me on. Um, my name is uh, Shadi Muhammad. Uh, I'm Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> right, as if I didn't know that. Got you. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, I mean, I don't know where to start, man. You know what I mean? Like, I, I converted to Islam uh, in 1997. Mashallah. Uh, I converted to Islam in prison, actually. Mm. And um, since then, uh, it's been an arduous journey, man, honestly. Mm. Um, I could have never, I never thought in a million years that, you know, the day I converted to Islam that I would end up where I am right now. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you don't plan for things like that. You know, Mm. this is just something that just, you know, as they say, some people just, you know, have, some people are born into greatness and some people have greatness just thrusted upon them. (laughs) And, you know, um, being in this position, you know, I mean, it is definitely a responsibility that Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily ask for. Um, but I'm here. I'm this is where I am at this point. And, um, you know, just hoping that, um, you know, when it's all over, that when I stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, I, you know, I, I did, I worked with the blessing that he gave me. Mm. Because everybody will be questioned about the blessings that God gives mm-hmm. them, you mm-hmm. know, and mm-hmm. how did you fare with that blessing? Mm-hmm. So I'm just hoping that I, I did the right thing with what was given to me, oh. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so converted to Islam, um, I went to the Islamic University of Medina, um, you know, maybe a year after coming home from prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got married, my wife had my son, mm-hmm. and then um, I got accepted into the Islamic University, um, 2001. Wow. I'm so I left, I went to Saudi Arabia, I stayed there from 2001 to 2007, mm-hmm. graduated with, um, you know, a few, you know, few things under my belt. You know, um, degree in Arabic, classic, classical Arabic language, as well as um, my tachasus, my you know specialty, which is hadith sciences. Mm. Um, nice. So, um, return back to America and just kind of get in where I fit in. Mm. You know, and that came with you know a whole 
you know, whole nother chapter, you know, <laughs> yeah. volumes of, you know, trials and challenges and, yeah. you know, everything that comes along with that. You know, here again, nothing that I could have ever prepared for, you know, when it's different when you're sitting on the musalla looking up at the imam on the mimbar and then you go from that to being the one on the mimbar. Yeah. You know it's what I mean? It's, like, a, it's a pressure. Oh, please, man. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it opens so many different chapters in my life. Wow. Some good, some bad, yeah. Yeah. some horrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you know, but it's it's all part of my narrative. It's yeah. all part of my journey. You know what I mean? Allah doesn't put more on your shoulders than you can handle. So obviously, you know, he he knows that I can handle. It. So so how was that transition? Because you mentioned three transitions, right? Yeah. One from uh, being in prison, mm-hmm. except in Islam. That was the first transition. Mm-hmm. Then second one was. You going from prison, getting accepted into the Medina Institute, yeah. right. and then living in a totally different country, right? We we know that um, African Americans are viewed a certain way in certain areas. So, what was that life like, right? Living in that chapter of your life, and then to come back here after, for for lack of a better way to say it, prison um, converts have a certain connotation towards them. They're very extreme, that mm-hmm. sort of idea, right? Mm-hmm. So, how was it going from? that mentality to being in Saudi Arabia and then coming here and they having to kind of adapt to mainstream Islam life here in America. And not and not only that, when you accepted Islam in prison, was it one of those things where it was like uh say in the units like you were in the belly of the whale and like that's like the only thing you legitimately found to kinda of get you out of the darkness? Or was it one of those things like, hey, if I want to be protected here and be <laughs> you know, like hey, are you trying to be real here, you know, like you know, just let us know no, which one was my, it. Like, my acceptance scenario? of Islam in, in prison was um uh, I don't think it was for either. Okay. It, it wasn't, you know, a pastime, nor did I do it for protection. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, from the Essex County area, everybody pretty much know everybody. So me going into prison, you know, I didn't necessarily need, you know, Islam for, you know, protection. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, I, I didn't, you know, only protection you needed in that environment is these right yeah, here. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? And yeah, I, I mean, like, I ain't, I ain't the best, but I ain't the worst either. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So I mean, like I, I can hold my own, man. You yeah. know what I mean? Like that—that that was never that was never an issue for me. But um, I, I, you know, I was along that journey, you know, probably from the time that I was around eleven years old. Um, you know, I've I, I've always believed in God. You know, mm-hmm. I, I never really I kind of disassociated myself from Christianity when I was around eleven, twelve. Um, I just felt like there were a lot of concepts in Christianity that just didn't sit with my heart and just my soul just didn't settle with it you mm. know what i mean and and that's just natural when you're trying to feed your soul something that it, it is rejecting mm. you know you're trying to feed it a concept and, and it's it's not natural your soul is not aligning with that concept so i just kind of walked away from christianity altogether and uh i just stuck with you know um my belief in god i believe in god you know and then um Fast forward, there there was a friend of mine who was who was murdered, and that kind of like there were there were, you know, God puts you know, you know, little things in your path, you know, to kind of help steer you in a certain direction. Yeah, you know, every when, day. You know, what I mean, when the loss of Penelope really wants to guide you, he yeah. constantly puts little signposts in your life, little things that that kind of even though you want to go this way, <laughs> these things are pushing you towards this direction because that's the direction that he wants you to go Mm -hmm. so um there was a friend of mine you know he used to rap with um the outlaws you know his Uh, name was Qaddafi. um that was like one of my best friends you know we grew up together really yeah yeah um his name is yafeyu yafeyu fuller um really cool um and uh once he he was he was murdered while i was while i was in the county jail i was in the essex county jail waiting to get sentenced and uh a girl came to visit me and she's and i can tell you can see the the look of death on somebody's face when, yeah. when you know yeah. i already knew i yeah. saw that look before yeah. you know my mother died when i was 16 i was incarcerated as a juvenile and when my aunt came to visit me it was the same exact look on her face Oof. i saw that look so when the girl came to the county jail to tell me that he was murdered it yeah. was the same exact look on her face before she opened her mouth I said, who got killed? And she was like, Gaddafi. I was like, you know, I just I just dropped my head. It's just like, 
my soul just came out of my body. You know what I mean? It's just like somebody just uppercuts you, hits you in your stomach and just knocks all of the air out of you. Yeah. And you just feel like, you know what I mean? Like, what am, you know, what is left for me? You know, like, what is left for me to do? I feel like everything was gone. Right. So yeah. that, that was here again, Allah steering me in that particular direction. You know, and then once I finally got down to prison, um, you know, there was a friend of mine that, you know, was already there and, you know, he had converted to Islam. Yeah. And, you know, this guy was, you know, he was a killer. You know what I mean? He was down for, for shooting somebody, yeah. attempted murder. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when I got down there and I saw that he was a Muslim, I was like, nah, there's no way. That I know this guy. There's no way this guy is a Muslim. And, you know, he gave me some books and things like that to take a look at. And, you know, um, and it's just, you know. The light bulb had already gone off in my head. So it was you kind of knew about Islam a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't my first introduction to Islam. Okay. You know I mean, okay. you know, being in the the juvenile correction facility, you know that that whole system, like you you run into people that yeah. are Muslim. You yeah. see certain things and you question certain yeah. things. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't my first introduction to Islam. You know, I, I had seen Islam prior to that. Mm. Um, and you know, the books that he gave me gave me, you know, um. The introduction to Islam, mm -hmm. you know, Malcolm X's autobiography. And, you know, I went back to my cell and I began reading, you know, but the light bulb was already off. When the light bulb is on, it's only a matter of time before you just go ahead and do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the light bulb for me was already on, yeah. you know, and uh, it just took, you know, the right moment, you know, for me to say, you know what? This is exactly the direction I need to go in my life. Because you know? you're already looking for an answer. Mm -hmm. There you go. It just came. Right. Gotcha. You're gotcha. already looking for something. You know that there's something deeper in your life. You know that there is a deeper purpose that your life is supposed to serve. You know, considering the fact that this guy, God took this guy and not me. Yeah. You know. Why? Why mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. and not me? You know, why him and not me? You know, and he wasn't a bad guy. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. he was, he was, he was a decent guy. He wasn't a bad guy. So it's like, well, why him and not me? So then that starts the question to you know, that start begs the question like, well, is there a deeper purpose for my life? And then you start on that journey. And if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants to guide you, He'll put he things in your life, people in your life that will continuously confirm mm -hmm. how you already feel until you just eventually arrive at that point where you're like, all right. This is it. So, you know, so that was one of, that was the reason that I converted to Islam. And mm -hmm. then, you know, after converting to Islam, that starts a whole nother journey. Yep. And then, you know, leaving prison and coming back out into the streets, that's a whole nother journey. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. in prison, when you convert to Islam, then you got all of these jailhouse Muslims, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. you got to sift through all of that to find out. Those who are sincere, those who are just Muslim for the stay, those yeah. who are just Muslim, you know, for protection, those who, you know, mm -hmm. you, you sift yeah. through all of that yeah. to see who's really sincere. Yep. And then you gravitate towards that. You begin, you know, you know, you begin digesting, you know, all of the information that they have. And then uh, then you transition out and into the world. And then when you transition into the world, you know. Like you said, there's a stigma that mm -hmm. is associated with people being Muslim in prison. There was actually a time in my life where I was actually ashamed of actually mentioning that I was in prison before, you know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I thought mm -hmm. that, you know, I would be lumped into that category. And today I don't mind. I'm, I'm very comfortable talking about it. Yeah. And I get a chance to debunk. Mm -hmm. A lot of those stereotypes. My entire yeah. life as a Muslim debunks that whole theory <laughs> that prison Muslims, jail Muslims, you know, are only Muslim just because they're in jail. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, I, I left prison in 2000. You know, I have never been back to jail since. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I've never yeah. missed a salat in my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying, like, I haven't been late for a prayer, but mm -hmm. there has never been a time from 1997 to 2019 that I did not pray five times a day. Allah, you understand Allah. what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that to toot my horn. I'm mm -hmm. saying that my narrative debunks that whole theory yep. of jailhouse Muslim. Yep. Yeah, that you're not really in it. That's... Right. And there's so many other Muslims. I'm not, I'm not an anomaly. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There are many other, you know, Muslims that I know yeah. of that are, you know, have never looked back. You mm -hmm. know, they do yeah. exist is what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, and then coming out and into the streets, you know, and, you know, trying to integrate into the Muslim community, mm -hmm. you kind of see 
it reminds me of something that Nas once said. He says sometimes the rap game reminds me of the crack game. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so when you convert to Islam and you you go back out, you're trying to move away from the whole street thing, yeah. that mentality, you know, mm-hmm. associating with those type of people. And then you come into the masjid and you see Muslims you see the same. trying to go in that direction, especially mm-hmm. Muslims that were born and raised Muslim. And it's yeah. like you don't want that. You that don't. that's not what you want. You know, trust me. I've been there. That's not what you want. Man. You know, and and it's just it's really sad because it's like you know, the more and more you try to move away from it, the more and more you see the Muslim community gravitating towards it. But not only that, you know? one thing I remember especially cuz cuz I'm an immigrant and my family's from an immigrant. So your story is really important to us because when you see an African American come out of jail and they're mostly like, "Oh, that's where he learned Islam." First, that's the first right. thing coming to mind. Then I right. think twice. But if a Somali or a Sudanese, somebody's locked up, like, okay, he's just a Muslim that's locked up. He mm-hmm. didn't learn Islam in there. There's no way he did. Mm-hmm. But it could have been that way, right? Mm-hmm. So you already dumped that stereotype for us immigrants, right? That was already off the bat. Right. Second thing, you like you were saying, come into the community, they're going to be like, oh, yeah. They're going to be like, stay away from him. You know, he just got out of prison and, and he, his Islam mm-hmm. isn't right. But not only that, immigrants... They want to be in the streets. Like, no offense. Like, as, as a matter of fact, the, <laughs> they, the like, first, the the brother who gave me my first mushaf in all Arabic was a Palestinian brother in prison with me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> right, look at that. He was Palestinian. He gave, his is. mother look came to visit and she bought five copies. I actually still have the copy upstairs. Oh, wow. so yeah. I still have the copy from 1997. I still have it. Yeah. She bought five copies of an all the all Arabic Quran, the, mm-hmm. the Mushaf, mm-hmm. and she gave it to him and told him to you know give it away sadaqa to yeah. you know other inmates that yeah. were there, and he gave me one. That was my first all Arabic Quran that was given to me in prison by a Palestinian. You understand? So this whole idea that. Every African American Muslim mm-hmm. must either be a convert or converted Nation. to Islam from prison. Yep. You know, it's it's really sad that that is the stigma yep. that hovers over our heads when we come mm-hmm. in contact with people from other cultures. Mm-hmm. I mean, but you know, here again, you know, we have to, you know, do I do deli- we have to tell our stories so once that story gets out, yep. people can now see that there's another side to that. Exactly. You understand? Exactly. And it is and is no story is the same. Like every instance is completely different. That's you true, and bro. one other person that That's has been true. that same time, got out at the same time, but your narrative is completely, completely different. Completely different. Mm. And then, you know, going into the most integrating into the Muslim community was another that's another trial. You know, you have <laughs> people discriminating against you, don't want to yeah. marry their daughters to you. Meanwhile, your daughter got two boyfriends. Yeah, like, oh, man. You, like you don't want to marry your daughter to me? That's like, coming in part two. <laughs> but you, let, let me tell you about your baby girl. Let me let me let me break it down to you. Yeah, you, do that. you got a false impression about your daughter who wear hijab yeah. and come to the match with you on Juma. Let me let me give you the real mm. rundown about your daughter. Just your wait, daughter's messing just wait with until eight o'clock. Ladies free till nine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like it's like you discriminated against me because I, I came home from jail, but, but your, you your daughter got two boyfriends that that's was in, that's in jail. You understand? What I'm saying? <laughs> oh no, my currently. goodness! <laughs> yeah, no, this right, is, this exactly. Serious, like, this you is, know what I mean? It's, it's it's really sad. And I had one brother. You goodness. know what I mean? Like. Who, who, despite my condition and despite my circumstances, man, he was still willing to marry his daughter to me. Wow. You know what I mean? And he didn't care about that, you know, because he was looking at, you he know, saw the person. The saw the heart. Right. He's mm-hmm. looking at the individual, not yeah. your circumstances. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and, and in the African-American Muslim community, I mean, how many 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old boys have not had a brush with the law at some point? Yeah, have not been, whether you were incarcerated for a substantial amount of time or you just had a minor brush with the law. Where you were arrested fingerprinted but that that's our narrative that's normal for us yeah awful. and then we become muslim and it's almost like oh you're one of those muslims like don't separate the culture from you know like that's still because nobody else does it it only comes to african americans when you gotta separate like, right you know yeah. when you yeah. come from egypt right you tell us separate the culture they're like what are you are you crazy right yeah, but we come here like yo what do you got you guys gotta separate that man. right like, right let your, let your slide at your wedding what do you mean like, <laughs> right like you can be muslim but you can't be african-american you can't, yeah. right. it, it, yeah. exactly that's, because exactly. They, they see like we don't have a culture that's so exactly so is, yeah. once you got out and you went to saudi arabia mm-hmm. right what did you take with you like of yourself what did you take with you there and why Saudi Arabia? Like, why didn't you think about going to school here? Well, the, I mean, answer his question first. What did I take with me? Well, mm-hmm. I, I'm gonna tell you what I didn't take with me. I didn't take the same. My first day in Saudi Arabia was not was not anything like my first day in prison. 
Your first day in prison, you like the first one to say something wrong to me. You know, I'm, I'm gonna knock yeah, his head yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I actually Sorry, didn't go start this Slamming University with the same mentality. First dude say something to me out the way. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm gonna I'm 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 knock his teeth out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I didn't take that mentality, but uh, I I I was very naive. Mm. I was very naive. Like you know, going to the Islamic University of Medina was was always like. Um, just a, a far-fetched dream for me. It's like, you know, I never even thought about ever. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I remember in prison, the imam had brought this young brother in who was studying at Yemen, studying in Yemen at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he got on the minbar, he gave the khutbah, and he yeah. was spitting Arabic. And I'm just like, whoa, I'm, a, I'm amazed. Because, you know, prior to that, all of the imams that ever came through the prison were old gray men, you know what I mean? Yeah. Old men. And like, all right, you respect them, but you can't really relate to them. Yeah. I was 20 years old when I converted to Islam. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. Pac had just got killed. I was thugged out, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you got to come better than that. You got to appeal to mm. where I am. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, bring me out of that. Right. I'm not, I'm 20 years old. Maybe where I'm at, yeah. And so when this young brother came in and got on the minbar and he's like, his Arabic is just pristine mm -hmm. and he's quoting ayats in the Quran and I'm just sitting in the, on, on, on the Musalla like, wow, mm -hmm. those brothers like that actually exist? And yeah. like, yeah, he's studying in Yemen and I'm just like, yeah. wow, I wish I ever had an opportunity. I wish I had an opportunity to do that. So it was always a dream to be able to go abroad and study and learn Islam and things mm -hmm. like that. So... Yes. Going to the Islamic University, you know, coming from where I came from, I had a different set of circumstances. So when I got there, my to my outlook on the whole Islamic University experience was completely different than a lot of the other younger brothers that was there. I don't think that there was one person there that had my circumstances. Yeah, there there yeah. was one Spanish brother. Um, I don't want to call his name out, but <laughs> there was one Spanish brother. And most of you guys know him. He's, he's an imam, mashallah. Uh, but he was also, you know, come from a similar situation from wow. where I came from. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that there was anybody else that that was in the Islamic University at that time that had my circumstance. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, was in prison for five years and come home for a year and then gets accepted into the Islamic University. So I was I was a very unique situation. And when I got there and I saw how the students there were interacting with one another, I was mind blown. You know what I mean? Yeah. You come from jail, you have this very idealistic outlook on Muslim brotherhood, the community. You know what I mean? Like my experience in prison. You think it's going to be like all goody goody? Right, right. Goody Kumbaya, goody. we all going to hold hands and we're all brothers. We're all going to pray together and right. touch toes. Like, nah, right. nah, they don't want and such a feet. It was the total opposite. You know <laughs> what I mean? It was the for the most part. I'm not saying that the brotherhood didn't exist, but the 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 my experience with brotherhood on the outside of prison was completely different than my experience with brotherhood on the inside of prison. Mm. Brotherhood on the inside of prison was like, man, I'll die for you. Yeah. I'll shank somebody for you. You know what I mean? I'll hurt somebody for you. I mean, like, you know, Muslims, you know, in the prison where I was at, Muslims had a big fight with, like, the bloods. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the blood, you know, did something to a Muslim. Muslims, you know, and it was like a, a huge fight. You know, like yeah. on the big yard, you know what I mean? And oh, that on was, the outside yard. Uh, yeah. In the yard. It was, it was serious. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the type of brotherhood that I came from. And then to come out into the Muslim community where you're like, all right, well, everybody's all brothers and it's yeah. all good. And it's just like, these yeah. people actually hate each other. <laughs> yeah. These people actually yeah. hate each other. These people yeah. actually make dua against each other. These people actually boycott one another and don't Crazy. give salams to one another. And I was like, mind blown. He was like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, what yeah. in the... Here again, sometimes the rap game reminds me. I'm just like, this is taking me back to a place that I am trying to get away from. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? The jealousy, the envy, the hatred. You know, yeah. I'm just like, whoa. That's so, my block. So, That's so, your block. So what'd you do? So what, um, what was your reaction? What'd you do? My reaction was to... It's the same as it is today. Is to... I'm, I'm one of those people, like, I'm not a, I'm not a follower. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of those people as I look at a situation and then I decide, you know, where I fall in. And I usually fall in the middle. I usually don't take this side or that side. I usually cut my own path mm -hmm. and I usually walk that path myself. I've been like that my entire life. So seeing the situation, I kind of, you know, at the beginning, I, I, I kind of 
dip my toe in it. You know yeah. what I mean? The whole yeah. Salafi, you know, attending the lectures of sheikhs and, you know, and I did it for my own gratification. Yeah, it yeah, wasn't yeah. to be a part of a clique because I never clicked with any of them brothers. Mm. I've, I've always, from the time that I left prison all the way up into this very moment that I'm speaking to you guys right now, I've always felt like I did not belong yeah. in the Muslim community. Yeah. Oh, okay. but you. But, but you I've know, always felt like, even right now to this very moment, I I'm a loner. I really feel like I don't belong in any Muslim community. And in, in in any circle, well, you know what I'm saying? Like I don't I don't belong. Well, Meaning, what about the young Muslim me, community? <laughs> let me let me let Welcome me explain. To the family. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I really felt like for years, like you know, maybe, and I could have been Shaytan, you know, mm. just you know, kind of. Riding the wave, you know, see yeah. me in the state of confusion, got you in the headlock. right, and he yeah, got yeah, you in the yeah. headlock, right. But I felt like, you know, all right, I'm not really with this because this is corny. You know, uh. this whole boycotting this brother, not giving salam to this yeah, brother, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. childish stuff. Yeah, that you know, what I'm saying, like, I didn't even, I didn't even move with people like that before I became Muslim. Like, yeah, I'm so not going to convert to Islam and, yeah. and you know, yeah. and move with people like that. So mm. I used to see these guys in the hallway. I used to walk right past them, never. I ain't even give them salams, you know, and this is where this whole idea, oh, he's arrogant, he's think he's it. And I, I wasn't arrogant. I mean, obviously, I have a cockiness to me uh -huh. because of the environment that I come from. Like, yeah. you know, in prison, if you want if you want to be respected, you, you have to have a, some level yeah, of cockiness, yeah, with, the, especially the, looking the way that I look. You know what I mean? Big Pretty boys get tried. They try your chin <laughs> real quick, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I had to be overly aggressive. Yeah, overly. You know what I mean? I, I had, had to, to be... Want. Overly aggressive to prove that, you know, because if you saw me in a crowd of people, I would probably be the one, the first one you say, I'm a test, I'm a test him. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? So yeah. I had to make it seem like I'm the one you don't want to test. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're the crazy so, guy in the crowd. Right. <laughs> I, and, and you can ask anybody that I rocked with, you know, before I became Muslim. I, I was a wild kid, man. I had to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? I had to prove. I had to. I had a point to prove. Yeah. Whereas somebody who doesn't look like me, he don't really have a point to prove. You you gonna think twice before you try his chin. Yeah. But the the pretty boy over here, I'm gonna try him because I know he can't fight. <laughs> I know he a sucker. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I had I had to prove a point so that you know that was my defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. So when I got to the university and I saw what was going on, I'm just like, that's corny, man. I'm I'm not a part of that. Yeah. And then. You had on the other side of that, you know, some stuff that was really legitimate, like really corny stuff, cornball stuff that, you know, dudes was doing on this side as well. And I just felt like I, I'm not, as Allah says, you know, I hate to use the example, but Allah says about hypocrites in the Quran, mm -hmm. they're, they're in between. They're neither of these and neither of those. And I, I was like that. I, I'm not a part of that. I'm cool with you, but I don't really rock with y'all like that either. Because yeah. y'all cornballs too. Exactly. You know what I mean? And exactly. so I just kind of cut my path in the middle and I and I walk my path and that's where I am now. So mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily affiliated with the Salafi community like that. And the mainstream Muslim community, I don't really rock with them like that either. They got, yeah. you know, hodgepodge of Sufism and music and all this other stuff. And I, I don't really rock with that either. Mm. I'm not, you know, to each his own. If yeah. that's the lifestyle you choose, if that's the path that you choose to get to God, so be it. Who am I to judge? But mm -hmm. I don't rock with that. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I don't, I'm, that's not necessarily my path. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm still in this middle path pasture yeah. yeah neither of these neither of those you know and, and I've, I've grown comfortable with that you know yeah. I've, I've grown comfortable in my own space you know of you know discomfort you know but, but it's funny because that's how we feel as young muslims you know because like i could be in this community one day this community the other day because we're always traveling and we're always mm -hmm. hanging out with friends and we don't consider ourselves well at least myself you know this sect or that or that we're just yeah. like hey we're muslim right let's just all come together so your story is how young majority Muslims, of us majority feel. how we're feeling now we're like yeah my dad's so caught up in going to that all afghan mosque i'm not i just want to go right. pray with my i just want to go pray i just want to go pray be muslim my friends without there. being labeled right that's it you know? I, I don't i don't need all the labels don't no. ask me if i'm sufi salafi don't i'm muslim, yeah, I'm muslim. and just leave, leave me with that. that yeah you can label me whatever you want mm, for exactly. your own you know for your own salvation or for your own sense of peace yeah but for me i don't need that title to define who i am i'm muslim and yeah. i'm grateful that allah guided me to islam and I'm I'm okay with that. How do you feel about do you I think we talked about this last time because yeah. people always talk about like innovation, innovation. Do you think that was like an innovation in regards to like uh, this school the, of the thought and, and all this sect? Like isn't that considered no, innovation? The, the, the whole idea of school of thought, 
you know, following a particular method have that, that's yeah. not an innovation. Mm -hmm. Um the the labeling yourself Salafi, not necessarily um an innovation, but the way that it was imposed on the community mm -hmm. was definitely not something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. It so wasn't something so. that the three mm. generations that came after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Now, I'm not gonna say that it is an innovation, but it is definitely not a part of Islam. Well it talks okay. about in the Quran how it will be divine the sex and things like that and mm -hmm. how that's not what we want as right. Muslims. Yeah. And I mean, you can, you can hold whatever belief you want. Like, yeah. you know, many of the scholars of the past that if you were to look at their biography from beginning to end, you could and, and weigh that against what the term Salafi actually means. Mm -hmm. You could say there are some parallels there. And if I was to apply the term Salafi to him, he would be considered a Salafi. But yeah. they never impose that on other people yeah. like you had to call yourself this and if yeah. you didn't then you were somehow ostracized or you somehow mm -hmm. you know what i mean like that yeah. that was not that it, it is counterproductive to the entire message of islam which is in inclusivity to embrace exactly. people exactly. and to bring people humanity yeah. wherever yeah. you are and bring you into the faith yep exactly you know so i mean you know so that was that was pretty much you know um Going into the Islamic University and you know, kind of seeing all of that stuff, and then well, coming well, back to well, America. Well, while you're at the university, were there any women there? Was it, was it all men's? No, it's all men. It was all men university. All men. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was married, so I lived off campus. So there were tons of brothers who were married that were there. Mm -hmm. And if you were married, you had your wife, you had your children with you. Then we we lived off campus in the community. Okay. Okay. So uh, okay. I, I never lived. I lived on campus for like two weeks. <laughs> that was about it. I got my like, own apartment. He was like, uh, yeah, because I mean, me. I wasn't. Yeah. I, 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 I was twenty five. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? So I, I it was oh, different. And, for so me. everybody else was really young compared to you, people, or like people were nah, not really probably young, between the ages between 20, 20, 20. 20, 21, 22 Okay, got you, got you. But got you. my twenty five was different than yeah, twenty five. Uh, yeah, for you know somebody who all right, he graduated from high school, he went to college, and, his and then mom he went to the Islamic his university. His parents sent him there. Right. Yeah. Hey, just go. So my 25 go was like, they're 35. You went to you know? another college. Right, I went to a school <laughs> of hard how, knocks. How, I mean, how was that, being at, like, at the school, did they speak English or was it straight Arabic? No, everybody spoke Arabic. How did you do that? You learn, you learn fast. That's what I'm saying. So you, you grew just up in the hood, you grew up in the environments that I grew up in, you adapt. You adapt. You go, I, I went to prison. Yeah, so you had, <laughs> you gotta adapt. You had no choice. So to adapt. here again, Allah steering you in that direction. You understand? Yeah. Mm. No, it's it's all all the dots connect. Yeah. You understand? <laughs> yeah. All the dots connect. It's not isolated, separated situations. They all connect. Even the tiniest of dots. Mm. Mm. All right. So after that, so now you're back in America. After right. how many how many years were you at school? Uh, six and some change. So you graduated. You got your accolades. You flexed, and then you came back to America, right? Right. Yeah. How was? What happened since you came back? <sighs> Um, and how was that experience being gone for so long? Like, uh, did you visit while you were gone for six? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, okay. I came home every summer. Okay, okay. I gotcha, came gotcha, home every gotcha, summer. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, what I mean, uh, hitting the lecture circuit. You know, yeah. dabbling in the lecture circuit here and okay. there. So okay. my feet was already wet. Okay. So gotcha. by the time you knew I graduated, what you were coming into. Yeah, right. Okay, when okay. I time, when I, by the time I graduated, I already my feet was already on the ground yeah, before okay. I even returned home. Smart you know man. I mean? Smart my man. I had already created a reputation for myself, you know, as a speaker, up and coming student of knowledge. So I, I was already my ball was already rolling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so what was your expectation then? Because you already were in the circuit. You already like okay. I see where my life is kind of going. This mm -hmm. is like my livelihood, more than likely. So once you get here, you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna start my career. I'm gonna start my life. How was that? Like, did it start how you thought? Was it? Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, I, throughout the years of me being there, I kind of saw little signs that you know it wasn't gonna really be much support. Mm. And I was going to pretty much have to carry that all by myself. Oh, you knew that? Yeah. And oh. so when I got home, um, I came home like the July 2007. And um, I didn't have no job. Uh, I had just published a book. And I was just kind of, you know, um, living off the royalties or the money that I made off of that book. And um, I'm running out of money very quickly. Yeah. So I call a brother, you know, who's a part of the administration of the masjid where I attended. And I'm like, listen, man, you know, talk to the board. I need some money. Yeah. He's like, listen, man, I'm going to say this straight to you. This was probably the realest conversation that I had. And I'm glad that I had it at such an uh, early phase yeah. mm -hmm. since my graduation. He said, listen, man, I'm going to tell you straight. He said, the masjid out here don't have money like that. 
People are Somebody not here? gonna yeah here in the America, US? yeah right, and I, in our circle in our community. Yeah, gotcha. he was like the massages don't have money like that. People are not gonna pay your rent. He yeah. was like, you know, I'm gonna go talk to the board and see what we can come up with to see if we can. He was like, but after that, you are pretty much on your own, yeah, man. After the, he's after like, the I don't know what you, you thought was what, what yo, was gonna yo, happen. You was thought the community was gonna take care of you. <laughs> he said, but people are out here struggling. You isn't know, that what, isn't that what the community is supposed to do? <laughs> well, I mean, there, there, there was a lot of truth to that because yeah. as a student of knowledge, you should have been making preparation, you know, to come yeah. home and be independent, you know? I mean, the community can only carry you but so far. You yeah. know, at some point, you have to now start to create streams of income for yourself and for your family. So it sounds like, this sounds very similar to college, though. Like, when you come yeah. out of college, your parents are only going to... You know, hold you for so long for they're like, yo, you better swim. Absolutely. Yeah. You gonna pay my and rent? And he was like, you know, I'm gonna talk to the board and see what we can do. He said, but after this, you're pretty much on your own. That's yeah. true. And he was like, you know, I can direct you to a place that's hiring, blah, blah, blah. And um, I went and I got a job as um, a clinical counselor okay. working at a halfway house. So I'm dealing okay. with inmates and doing group therapy and things like that. And, and which actually helped me because that was like my launch pad for. Where I am right now to wow. today. You, you, been, you started out Here doing again. classes Let's, and you're doing classes now. The dots connect. Yeah. Mm. The dots all connect. Yeah. You know what I mean? Some of what I was teaching as a clinical counselor in the halfway house, I incorporate right now in some of the classes that I teach. Gotcha. I have a online classes, courses that I teach, 10-week courses, and a lot of that material, you know, as a matter of fact, I wrote a book while I was working there in, mm. in, at the job <laughs> that was, you know, premised on a lot of the work that I was doing there. A lot of the books that we were, you know, reading from and teaching from self-help books. So okay. I actually wrote my actual first book that I wrote on my own, which is called He Came to Perfect Moral Character. Mm. I wrote that book from working at that job, you know. Um, Dale Carnegie's book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yes. Very, very popular book. Yeah. book. All right, one of my coworkers, non-Muslim, he gave me the book and yeah. I read through it and I'm just like, so my 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 manager who was Muslim, um, he came to me, he was like, yo, um, why don't you take that book and why don't you write another version of that in Islamic form? Mm. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. <laughs> That's and okay. I, 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 I left that job in 2009, I left that job. November 2009, I left that job. I went to back to Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and I was teaching in King Saud University. I started writing that book on the plane. 13 hour ride. I'm writing everything. I I'm very cathartic. Uh, you know, writing is cathartic for me. It's very mm -hmm. therapeutic. Yeah, you you like so in your writing. notebook before we start. You're just writing, yeah. writing, right? Yeah. And um, 13 hours pass, you know, I'm writing. By the time I land in Saudi Arabia, I get my job squared away. Every day I came home from work, I'm writing more, writing more. Wow. Then I begin typing it up. And the book, I just revised the book last summer. It's called He Came to Perfect More Character, The Persona of Prophet Muhammad Through My Eyes. Mm. And I wrote that book off of Dale Carnegie's book, how to win friends and influence people. So you say you're doing a revised version of that? It was it was revised last it, summer. It, it, last it, summer. Yeah, okay. I wrote it in 2009. I just revised it in 2000. The 10 year anniversary. Nice, nice. Yep. Where, where can we find that book? Just like an early um, plug. Uh, I usually self I self publish. So okay, got you. Um, that particular book is not on Amazon yet. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But you can purchase the book through me directly. You okay. can send me an email if you're interested. Imam Shadid Muhammad at Gmail. And um, and I, I I sell my books, you know, um, independently because a lot of the Muslim vendors, you know, a lot of the bookstores, they don't really give you, they don't cut you a break. They want, you know, 60, 70 percent discount. Ooh, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So why do you think that is? Because we talk about that a lot, how in the Muslim world, we we seem to shortchange one another when it comes to our services, when it comes to our products. Yep. And then on the, the other end. We we make it hard to work together. So as creators, we're creators. We got you know doing our thing. Other creators will be like, yo, like full price. Not not even that the full price is the issue, but it's like there's no room for us to actually collaborate. It's just mm -hmm. transactional. So there's no relationship. Mm -hmm. And like have, we we're experiencing that, and it's very difficult to traverse through the Muslim world where there's so many other options. Mm -hmm. Like okay, well you guys are going to treat me like that. Well I'll go with someone else. Yeah. Right. Is is it's just a lack of uh, business acumen, you know what I mean? It's just a lack of business savvy mentalities, you know what I mean? A lot yeah. of so-called Muslim businessmen are just really hardline, 
uh, black and white. You know, this is what it is. There is no negotiation. And if you're negotiating, then the bulk of the, the benefit is going to be on my side, not yours. Yes. Like, I'm, not, I'm not working, so we both which can win. It's crazy because that's not, as Muslims, that's what, not what we're supposed to do. It's supposed to be win win on it's each side. It's supposed to be fair, very fair. Man. Man, you know, we, you know, that's, that's just what it is. You know, yeah. you know, when you don't, when you when you lack that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you when you feel like you're gonna be shortchanged, you know, you you hold you hold your cards yeah, tight. Yeah. You know what I mean? But when you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know that there's no losses for you as a believer. The Prophet said, La Yankusu La Yankusu man. That you know, sadaqa does not you know, your your wealth does not subtract because you gave sadaqah. It does not decrease. Your right, exactly. You giving. don't lose money by giving it away. Yep. You you gain more. But that mentality can only come from someone who has a you know a better relationship with Allah. Obviously, if you mm -hmm. don't have a great relationship with God, then everything for you is take, take, take. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like you don't you don't you don't leave that little bit of cushion, that little bit of room that God got you, and that He's <laughs> gonna make sure you are right. Because you trying you trying to make sure you because got you me. trying to make sure somebody else is straight. And God is going to make sure you're straight. Always. You know, the Prophet yeah. Wasallam said that you know um, uh, that Allah will Allah will continue to benefit the Muslim so as long as the Muslim is benefiting his brother. Yes, you know what I mean. So that means that the more you are extending to somebody else, whatever whatever slack that you feel you're going to take as a result of that, Allah will pick that up. Yeah. Wow. You know, Allah picks that up. You know, like you don't lose. You know what I'm saying? The Prophet Wasallam he said to his companions. One time he, he was talking about, you know, towards the last days, there will be evil rulers. So some of the Sahaba said, well, should we revolt against them? Should we rebel against the rulers? Mm -hmm. And he said, no. He said, Addu ilayhim haqqahum. He said, give them their rights. Wasallallaha haqqahum. And ask Allah for your rights. Mm -hmm. Still give them what is theirs. And whatever you feel like you lost, you get that from God. Mm -hmm. he, he'll pick that up. <laughs> he'll pick up the tab. He'll pick up that, that flat. You know that I mean? reminds me of a Kendrick bar. I can't think of it directly but it was in uh, the pimple butterfly he was like um something about recognition but whatever i get oh that's god's decision mm -hmm. and so it reminds me of that it's like you can do you know do what you gotta do and any injustice guys got your back yeah he'll pick that up you know what i mean but that that comes from someone who has a certain mindset and a certain relationship yeah a but, deeper relationship with god mm -hmm. you know what I mean? but you said earlier about the businesses i mean i think the reason why it's like that is that because just culture like you know back at home with arabs they're always negotiating. Here in America, there's no negotiation. The price is the price. So over there, it's like everybody they meet is Muslim, and there's people that just don't know how to do business. So they're always trying to beat everybody down and try to get... It's always about price because everybody, like, everybody looks like you over there. So it's not really like, oh, I need to look out for him. He looks like me. Everybody's right. like me over here. I just yeah. need to look out for myself. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's why point. it's like that culturally, you know? Got that's why. So when they you. come here, and they see like, okay, I got to sell it for one price, you know? And... You're Muslim, okay, that doesn't change nothing. You know what I mean? I can't negotiate with you. I can't say gotcha. hi. This is the price. You know, they may look out for their people, but other than that, they may not. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the mm -hmm. reason why they do business like that. That's a good point. They're yeah. not used to that. Good, yeah. perspective. So you say you start teaching classes from the first class that you taught um, to the class you teach now. How have they evolved? And like, what were the first topics that you were teaching on? Um, they have evolved tremendously. I mean, uh, I started off with... A lot of the basic materials that you usually find being taught in a masajid, you know, mm -hmm. Usul al Thalatha, the three fundamental principles, you know, the basics of Salah, basics of Wudu, Arabayin and Nawawiyah, you know, the 40 hadith of Imam al Nawawi, yeah. you know, um, Riyadh al Salihin, you know, just some basic texts mm -hmm. that, you know, people usually teach in masajid. Masajid yeah. have, you know, there's a certain. There's a certain path that you have to follow if you're going to teach in Masajid, you know, and then once you kind of deviate from that path in terms of now evolving and teaching matters that, you know, that require, you know, that that, that dig deeper into the social fabric yeah, yeah, in which yeah, we're yeah. living in, mm -hmm. Masajid consider that political, you know, oh. and as a result of that, you'll find that many Masajid will not welcome a lot of that talk. So if you're, you know, you start speaking about, for example, homosexuality, yeah. You know, talking against it not yeah. in support of it but against it you'll find a lot of the massage will close their doors on you because it goes against the the political you know um the political fabric that they that they're trying to maneuver their way into yes you know, that everybody's looking for that political security so yeah yeah you know to to invite an imam in who's controversial and talks about controversial topics it's like 
you got to create your own your own platform for that. The massages are not going to be receptive to a lot of that. Yeah. So I had to evolve because my outlook on Islamic teaching, you know, was not just solely based upon the basics of Islam and the rituals of Islam. So exactly. when you start talking about marriage, you start talking about divorce, you start mm -hmm. talking about raising families, raising children, mm -hmm. you start talking about the political sphere and, you know, what Muslims should be involved in, what to what extent and to what extent they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, board members start looking at, like, they start, people start to really take personal offense to that. Yeah. Like, he talking about me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. you go in about a, a issue of divorce and how yeah. brothers are mistreating their wives. Yeah. You have three brothers on the board who that, talk was applicable to them. They're like, oh, hold on. Who is this man? And they take, <laughs> no, I kid you not. Well, no. I kid you not. Man. And they take personal offense to that. Yeah. Meanwhile, you're just doing what you love to do. Yep. Just teaching, yeah, preaching. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, you're not attacking anybody personal. You don't even know anybody's yeah. personal business. How can you? Exactly. You understand? Exactly. You're just doing what you love to do, but you have someone here that's in a position to, you know, close a door or two. And he's offended, or she's offended, yeah. and they close those doors. You know, and I come to the law, my chef, I, I, you know, I don't, you know, it is what it is. I mean, it, it doesn't stop. Yeah. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing. And alhamdulillah, Allah has always provided me with a platform. Well, and that's what I was going to say, because <laughs> you talked about it um, before, where when you came back from university, you had to, you had to finesse. You had to think, mm -hmm. okay, I can't rely on the master to pay my rent. That's yep. not going to happen. Yep. How can you create your own platform? And own the the lake. How can you own the stream so that now you're bringing in your own revenue? Right. And so those classes have been the thing that's. I mean, that's how we found you. We found you because of, like you were talking about marriage and you were doing the online course and things like that. And mm -hmm. I was like, we need, to, we need to listen to this. <laughs> so stuff like that is what's got you here, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not that. I mean, because. Uh, I started off with Instagram like everybody. I started at zero. Yeah. Like, like you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like everybody on Instagram no starts different. at zero. You know, yeah. when you open up, the day you open up your Instagram account, you have zero followers. Yeah. You know not like, they're not like MySpace. MySpace starts with Tom. Right. Right? Give Tom me was positive. the first friend. <laughs> so I started off like everybody else. But what happens is you just do what you love doing. Like yeah. when, mm -hmm. when you're not looking for accolades, you're not, I, I'm not really looking for followers. I may have 10 K plus followers. However, I'm only following like 14 people, 15 yeah. people, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like I'm not in it for that. Yeah. I'm not in it for the fame, the glory that I'm not, I'm just doing what I love doing. Mm -hmm. I yeah. put the content out, whoever can benefit, can benefit from it. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And that's that, yep. you know what I mean? And we don't mean, what I'm saying is that we don't control the outcome. Yeah. Only thing we can control is our part, what, what the part we play in it. Mm -hmm. As it relates to how you found me, you know, you found me because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed you to find me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to anybody you. Brought, brought you to me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You understand? Like, yeah. here again, steering in that direction. Yeah. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. Our entire conversation from beginning to right now, it's all connected. All connected. Yeah. Everything. You know what I'm saying? So, you just do what you, you love doing, you know what I mean? And that's it. You know, Allah told the Prophet Sallallahu you didn't throw when you threw, but it was Allah who threw. Mm. Meaning this was in reference to an incident that happened where he picked up a handful of dirt and he threw it. And that one handful of dirt went into the eyes of a thousand soldiers mm. on, on the enemy lines. And Allah says that you didn't throw when you threw, but we threw. Meaning you are responsible for the action, the end result was in the hands of a lost kind of time. You don't control the result. And that's a life lesson. You Absolutely. Know, it, it, like, you, you just show up every day, you put in the work, and Allah will take care of us. But you gotta do that. So that's right there, just like Sometimes day. I put a video, I'll upload a video, I'll upload a clip. Yeah. And it might get like 200 views, yeah. 300 views. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll upload a clip, and it's up to like 8,000 views. Yeah. Wow. You know what I mean? Somebody might say, well, I, this needs to be spread over the Muslim community. All the Muslims need to hear it. No, Allah is only going to allow to hear that who needs to hear it, needs to hear it. who he wants to hear it. So, like I said, I might, you know, I might upload a video. It might get a couple of hundred views. I might upload a video to get a couple thousand views. I, like, just do what you love doing, yeah. Yeah. you know, and let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala handle the rest. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Uh, students of knowledge that are graduating from the university coming home, they have to, and I mean, it's easier now with, you know, the different social media platforms. Like, you know, these platforms didn't exist in 2007. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, exactly. Instagram, 
you didn't have any of that stuff. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You you had, you know, other platforms that you know weren't as effective, and you couldn't reach as many people that you can reach with the platforms we have today. So you know, it's it's imperative for students of knowledge that are returning home to find your niche. You know, find your niche and and work within that niche. You know? So so should now students of knowledge now should they start thinking more like businessmen and entrepreneurs, knowing that they got to come back and not get the same support? Like for example. We have a sheikh in my community, right? He, he, you know, he makes money, but he tells legit, hey, look, I make money, but because I own a contracting company, like right. I do construction. It's not because this message, you guys don't give me nothing. Right. <laughs> Straight <laughs> well, up. And I, I was sitting there like, it, I was sitting there like, yo, this dude has a good point because we think the imam comes in, the sheikh comes every day, turns on the lights, turns it off, and yeah. somebody's taking care of him. You know what I'm saying? Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where did he work? Did he have a job or did he rely on the handouts of the people? Yeah, he had right. a job. He, he had nine wives at one time <laughs> with children, stepchildren. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you know, gotta, gotta how eat. was he providing for yeah. them? How was he taking care of them? He had multiple streams of income. Look at that. Multiple streams of income. Number one, he had what is called al fait and that is the spoils of war. So when they go to war yeah. and the enemy runs off the battlefield, the, the Muslims booty. collect the, the booty. war booty, yeah. everything that's on the, on the floor. Yeah. Um, a fifth of that. Goes to Allah and his messenger from the door. He takes that off the top. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. That's his. And the rest. And most of that, he would give away sadaqah anyway. You know what I mean? Exactly. He gave a guy 100 camels. You know, his wives were He put his up life on arms. the line. I mean, he put his know? life on the line. I mean, everybody's life on the line. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, exactly. that, that goes to him. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, off the top. Yeah. And you know most of that stuff, he would just give away anyway. He wasn't, <laughs> you know, he wasn't that type of person, yeah. you know? Um, and one time he gave a guy a hundred camels. So they used to usually have a guy who would run back into the city and say, you know, basically we came up, you know what I mean? The <laughs> enemy, enemy ran off the field. You know what I mean? They left horses, they left armor, they left weapons, they left all, you know what I mean? They even left their women on the, you know what I mean? Like it was a, it was a complete come up. Wow. So the guy runs back into the city and he's like, yo, we came up, we got this. So the prophet's wives are like, he got a hundred camels. Yeah. So they're waiting for the hundred camels to come back. And when he returns back to Medina, his wife is like, well, where's the hundred camels? She's like, oh, I gave those away, Sadaka. It's like, what? <laughs> How? And this is, you know, the incident where he ended up boycotting his wives because he felt like they were pressuring him to give them this. more of I the dunya. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yes. Yes. He boycotted them for a whole month because he felt like they were pressuring him to give them more of the dunya when his life of mediocrity was by choice not by circumstance he chose to live like that yeah. as a matter of fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know gave him an option Allah sent an angel to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he awesome. said I am an angel that Allah sent to, sent me to you to either make you a prophet who is a king uh, yeah. Malakun Rasul yeah, or that. to make you Abdun Rasul to make you a king who is a messenger like Prophet Suleiman or to make you a servant who is a messenger just you know just a regular person and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what did he choose he just chose to be a regular servant Sorry, Muslim yeah. that's it that was my choice that was my choice so he had that he also had um, contracts with the Jewish community that lived in Medina Really? They had to sign contracts to live in Medina, oh, yeah. and they used to pay what's called jizya, a land yeah. tax, yeah. Yeah, in order. That land tax went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's a real estate That's the owner second too. Thing, second, <laughs> second stream of income. You understand? <laughs> yeah. So, and I mean, like I gave an entire lecture about this before. So, I mean, even with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had multiple streams of income. They said the average millionaire has at least seven streams of income. Yeah. So, when you look at the blueprint of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, even down to the finances yeah. covered. Wow. So for a student of knowledge to graduate from any university and return home without at least having a business mentality, you don't necessarily have to have the whole blueprint mm -hmm, laid mm -hmm, out, yeah. but you have to at least think in terms of how can I generate streams of income to support me and my family? Yep. Because the last thing that you want to do as a student of knowledge, uh, if you want your dignity, is to go around asking and people. Begging. Oh, yeah. Man. That's the quickest way for you to lose your heba. Heba is the sense of awe that you know people feel when you walk into a room. Mm -hmm. okay, you know what I mean? You. The got quickest you. way to lose that is to ask a person for money. They don't see you like that anymore. It's the, I don't say sakatam and aini. You know, you kind of fell from my eyes. I don't. I don't see yeah. you with that level of respect anymore. Man, and it's important coming from an imam because we were legitly, well, you know, spoiler. We're, we're going to do an episode legitly just on finances, on money. 
because they'll be like, look, don't worry about it. Just go out there. God will take care. I get it, but I got to go out there and hustle. You, you know, gotta but make, like, you gotta make that money. And, and then they'll be like, don't worry about the money. The money's about the dunya. Like, that's too yeah, much. You guys we'll getting caught up. I understand people do too much for the money. I'll be honest with you. There's yeah. some people that just yeah. go on social media and do, and do some wild stuff. I'm not talking, you know, still keep your integrity, but it's so important that we talk about this because Muslims don't talk about money. And I think we're behind on that, you know, because yeah. especially because we have American money. Muslims. Well, well I, oh. see, I see it mainly amongst, I, I think. The people who put it out there the most are the women, right? They're like, "Don't fall for the dunya," like you know, just keep keep your head you think on. So? Yeah, I, that's, I, that's, that's in my experience. Of, that's what I think I'm it's seeing. the opposite. <laughs> really, really. I think the uh, women just naturally inclined towards worldly things. I, I just think that mm. that's part of their nature. Allah describes them as such in the Quran. He said, "Awa may yunashiyu fil aliyati, wa huwa fil khisami ghayr mubin." Can the one who was raised in trinkets. And in a heated argument, she can barely articulate herself. This is the description that Allah gives women in the Quran. And mm-hmm. she was raised in trinkets. We get our daughter's ears pierced at like three, four months. Yeah. yeah. What, what yeah. is it trinket? from, from trinkets? Like jewelry. jewelry. Oh, okay, okay. Shiny stuff. Hello. <laughs> hey, I ain't got no girlfriend, so uh, or wife, so. <laughs> you got sisters? I do got sisters. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He they, said they, 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 they didn't have. They were the exception. They weren't raised in trinkets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you weren't like that. We had rubber bands. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean that's that's just that's part of their nature. And that's yeah. not to say that every woman, you know, inclines towards worldly things. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, you'd be surprised to find someone who doesn't. It, yeah. it would be surprising to me to see a woman who does not want. I mean, even the Prophet Sallallahu wives were inclined. Many of them inclined towards worldly things. Hence, the fact he boycotted them for pressuring him to give them more of the worldly things. Oh, I need that Versace belt. I need that that Gucci purse. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Crazy. I mean, if you if you got it, there's nothing wrong with it. But yeah. you know, to you know, sell your soul to have it, then that yeah, means yeah. And, and that's what we're seeing a lot of. We're seeing a lot of people go out of their nature to do things that you just shake your head at for things that don't really matter at the end of the day. Attention is the new yeah. currency. Yeah, like like is, like Jamal said, clout. But chase not, that clout. It doesn't convert. Yeah. You know, it doesn't people convert people will do strange things. I mean, like even on social media, you sure. know, I was listening. Um, uh, Dang, I, I was listening to an interview um, um, where um, this guy is, you know, I listen to a lot of these interviews on YouTube or whatever. So this guy, my son, is um, a rapper slash advocate. So he said he, he goes into Rikers Island. He goes into like different prisons to talk to the youth. So he said he went in to speak with Bobby Smurder because Bobby Smurder was, was in Rikers. Yeah. So he said he goes in and he had a conversation with him. He's like, you know, and... Bobby Smurder was like, you know, a lot of the guys in there be trying to get at him, you know, just for clout, you know, just, like, to, just to say I knock Bobby Smurder out yeah, or I, I, I beat him up. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, like people yeah, just yeah. do crazy things just for clout. And even in the Muslim community, like I'm I'm one of those people that, you know, if you attack Shadid Muhammad, you'll become famous yeah. overnight. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. then you'll have someone who out of nowhere, yeah. you know, out of nowhere just come and say, Oh, Shadid Muhammad is this or he's that yeah. whatever. and automatically overnight you're yeah. you're popular, you're yeah. famous. Yeah. You know, clout chasing. You know what I mean? Because That's real. I mean if you were really serious about becoming famous, then go about it the right way. Go about it the yeah, right put way. Put in the work. Yeah, exactly. Shadid exactly. Muhammad did not become Shadid Muhammad overnight. Yeah, this he, is a process, an yeah. ongoing process because yeah. I'm still evolving. Still I'm still a work in progress. Still you know what I, mean? like, I have not reached my pinnacle. You understand what I'm saying? Like I haven't reached my pinnacle. I'm still making mistakes. I'm still living my life. I'm still, you know what I mean? My, mm-hmm. my book is not closed yet. <laughs> my chapter has yeah. not been put a period on it yet you know what i mean there, mm. there's still you know an evolution to me you know mm. and you have people who sit back and look at you where you are currently and what where you are currently without looking at the whole history exactly you know that exactly. came behind where you are like i've been in, i've been in this i've been at this for a long time man yeah. people forget that i've you been know. at this since 2003 2004 over 15 years you understand yeah and and still at it, you know, on different levels. Like so, it's not you know. And somebody just come in and say, "I'm just a nobody, not even a student of knowledge." Just come in and say, yeah. "Oh, Shadi Mom is retarded. He's a stray. He's this. He's that." And yeah. overnight, you're an overnight sensation. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's literally that easy. But it's like you said, is is how you get is is not how much you make is how you make it. That's important. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, Allah is going to judge us on that as well. Absolutely. How you, you got your money. Yeah, you getting your money by slandering people. Or like, we had a podcast where it was like, we just coming at people and like just bashing people. Yeah. 
we won't even. And want the thing that. is, is that you're going to get the popularity you're looking for. Yeah. All right, but at what expense? Yeah. Right. What are you sacrificing to get mm-hmm. that? Because you could sit around and create a podcast and backbite people and talk about people, and you could become the most popular podcast, the most popping podcast mm-hmm. out there. Yeah. But at the expense of what? Expense of what? Yeah. At the expense of your hereafter, because everybody you back bit, you're gonna have to pay that back. You're gonna, to, you're gonna have to face them too. Absolutely. They're gonna face Yomo Kiyama, and people are not gonna have mercy, Yomo Kiyama. They're not gonna you think know? about nobody. Yomo Kiyama, it'll be nefsi nefsi. I'm only worried about myself. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. trying to get those has narcissism <laughs> in this life is nothing compared, compared to the narcissism in the hereafter. Man. Especially on that last day when I'm lacking. Because, I'm like, Yo, my I, I mean, we're talking low. about even a father will turn to his children and yep. say, was I not a good father to you? Give me some of your good deeds. That is the epitome of narcissism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> remember that one time? You understand? <laughs> like a, a, wife, <laughs> a wife will look at her husband and say, was I not a good wife to you? Give me some of your hasanat, your good deeds. Mm-hmm. So oh, if you that. think narcissism is something in this life, you haven't seen anything. Yom wow. You know, where Allah says, you know, that a pregnant woman, once she hears the the, the trumpet blowing the on the last day, the, the pregnant woman will spit her baby out because yep. she doesn't want any responsibility. Yep. Only concerned about yep. herself. Yep. That's weird, though, because it seems as though, you know, we, we, we're taught that we need to be people that come together and, and, and treat others and, 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 and do that, right? So for a woman to just boop, Drop the baby, yo. Self, like, it's, it's all it's, about self. Yeah, it's moment. like it's, it's wild. Yeah. So that means that all this time we have now, we not supposed to be about ourselves. You know, supposed to kind yeah. of care for people. But you know, after this question, kind of want to get back to your journey. Can you tell us the difference between helping people and putting others people's like putting people first and sacrificing yourself? You know, something that's really big. Because man, maybe you get this question, maybe you don't. And the I don't want to say the immigrant community, maybe the black community. The fam, you got to put everybody before you into before you get to yourself. You know what I mean? Make sure everybody gotcha. eats. Make sure that everybody's taken care of. But you're legitly drained, maybe running on 2%. But that doesn't matter because everybody else has to be good, you know? Mm-hmm. So what type of advice do you give to people like that? Especially people with, like, big families or big responsibilities. Jabril's the oldest. I'm the oldest. So it gets to a point where it's just like, yo, I'm going to do it's, what's it's good for me. It's always, it, it's nothing wrong with choosing you. Sometimes you have to choose you. So that's good to hear. So there's a hadith, right? There was, um, <laughs> that's good to hear. There's, man. there's a, let me provide some Islamic context. Please, to this. please. So there was a hadith. Um, this woman, her name was Barira. Mm-hmm. Barira was a, a slave. She was a female slave, and she was a very close friend of Aisha, mm-hmm. the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wife. And Barira was married. Mm-hmm. She was married to a man by the name of Murif. And uh, Barita goes to Aisha one day, and they used to have something called Mukataba, where the slave would have an opportunity to earn his freedom, purchase his own freedom. Okay. So if he had to go borrow money from other people, go do odd jobs outside of the time that he works for his slave master, um, then he could generate his own money and then eventually purchase his freedom from <laughs> his slave owner. So Barita goes to Aisha and says, you know, ask the Prophet Wasallam to borrow money because I want to purchase my freedom. So Aisha goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, gets Salaam. the money from the Prophet. Yeah. The Prophet gives it to Aisha, gives it to Barita. Barita goes, gives it to her owner, purchase her freedom. Boom. She's free. Mm-hmm. However, when she purchased her freedom, she also did not want to be married to her husband anymore. Oh, really? Because he was still a slave and she she's not in that space anymore. Oh, I mean, damn. I don't want to be married to you anymore. Because he was a slave or just because of him? Uh, the narration doesn't does, mention, does, does, does but it could have okay, possibly gotcha, been gotcha, both. Gotcha. It mm-hmm. could have been both. Maybe yeah. she just wasn't feeling him. Mm-hmm. Maybe she was, you know, understand something about women. Um, a woman, most of the time, especially for those of us who are married, and I would like to say this with all humility, I would like to believe that most of us who are married are only married because there is no other option. Mm. In the Muslim community, the options are very, the pool is very shallow. I found the best one. (laughs) You know what I mean? The pool is very shallow. So, you know, for many of us, you know, (laughs) understand something. Women different from men. A woman can have any man she wants, but a man cannot have any woman that he wants. I, I agree. Yeah, you okay, understand? Yeah, I see yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, a yeah. woman can have, you know, I mean, like Usher slept with a big girl. You know what I mean? Like, 
I mean, nothing against big women, but <laughs> it just shows her boldness. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't care what type of superstar you are. I see like, what you're I, I want you, and 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 I can have you. Yeah. You Yo, understand what I'm saying? Like, you understand? <laughs> I'm, I'm just, the, the this facts. Is, facts. I'm, I'm just stating facts. Yeah. A oh, woman can have any man meet. she wants. <laughs> a woman can have any man she wants. Wow. Yeah. But a man cannot have any woman that he wants. Yeah. All right. So what I'm saying that to say is that, you know, she at that moment, maybe she was married to him because under those circumstances, that is, you know, she was a slave. So no free man is going to marry her. Oh, you understand? Yeah. So she her pool was very shallow. So she was thinking about herself. She was like, this. Is, let me think about me. Right All right. Now. So she purchases her freedom yeah. and then she decides, I don't want to be married to you anymore. So she's walking down the street, as the narration mentioned, and Mughith is chasing behind her, crying his poor little heart out. Yeah. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Yeah. So the Prophet ﷺ goes to Berita and says, he's the father of your child. So Berita looks at the Prophet ﷺ and she says, uh, are you commanding me to stay with him or do I have a choice? The Prophet ﷺ said, Inni shafir, I'm just trying to intercede on behalf of this poor man. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. For you to choose what you want. Sounds- and Barita said, I have no la hajat ali lahu. I have no desire to be with him. Mm-hmm. She chose herself. Despite what other people thought, she didn't care. She chose herself. Sometimes it is okay to choose you mm-hmm. despite what other people want to think about it. Because the thing about it is that people will people will not remember the 99 things you did for them. They will only remember the one time you said no. Yeah. That's oh, it. yeah. Trust me. I, I see that all the time. The one time you say no, I can't, is the only thing that they will remember. Yeah. The other 99 things that you've done for them throughout your entire relationship. It won't matter. You know what I mean? Dang. So... Um, I mean, with all due respect, I mean, to, you know, different cultures and cultural traditions and ethics mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be, I think it is totally okay at some point to choose you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because because in America, they say that we're very selfish and individualistic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But when you go elsewhere, it seems we like... Are. It, we are. It, it, we are, right? I'm not, I'm not denying that. Mm-hmm. But there's a freedom because you have that choice where mm-hmm. you don't have to be that way. Like yeah. me close to my family I do stuff for them I do my own thing yeah. right. but in other cultures it seems like there's that that the expectation yes. Yes. exactly it's the expectation right. where oh you can't what you can't do that right what about us yeah right yeah. so now you're very even, limited even down to who you who you want to marry you yeah. have many you know um, Muslims that are not African American that come from different cultures who the the expectation is that you're supposed to marry who your parents want you to marry like yes, I mean yeah. You know, and and that's just unrealistic. Like, I have to marry. (laughs) Like, you know, my extension, my extending myself to you goes all the way down to even who I have to marry. I have to marry someone to please you. That's wild. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, when do we draw the line? That's, there is no line. It's just like. Then that's a problem. Because any relationship that doesn't have boundaries is toxic. Ooh. Oh, dang. Say that one more time, please. Any relationship that does not have boundaries <laughs> is toxic. Yeah, no, this this is this is even the salt water and fresh water have a line. One goes down, one goes up. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <laughs> says in the Quran that the salt water, fresh water, there's a line, a boundary that separates them. They we don't can, crash into each other. This and this is, is with water. This is interesting. We we actually see that. Where I'm from, you've seen it. You've yeah. seen it. This there's is. a bay where the bay and the ocean meet, and you can literally see it clear as day. There's a line. That it is wild. That's right. Good. So wild. if that's the case with and and that and that's nature. So that that's, shows you that anything that is natural has to have boundaries. Huh. Yeah. Anything that is natural it's, has to have boundaries. To us. Damn, that is a lot of people right now are probably raising eyebrows like, yo, that's I mean, no, so, no you're right about that. So you, you we we we've we've touched on the topic of marriage and I kind of want to I want to dive in there a little bit because neither one of us are married. No, not nah, three of us are married, right? No one's married. And shot. May Allah have mercy on me. <laughs> I, I really feel sorry. Like, but it's the, pit, it. the core of my stomach just <laughs> kind of aches a little bit for you, man. Like I, I just couldn't imagine going home single every night. That's it's, 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 it's a it's a hard pill to swallow. I got my co host. <laughs> But that's their boundaries. They're big boundaries. Big boundaries. A big, so a, a big bold boundary right here. I'm drawing that line right here, Mo. I'm trying to make single life look as distasteful as I possibly can. So you rush home today and go look. You start. You making it bad. Making, I'm making it preparations bad. for marriage. You still single? Look, for, look, for, not, for nothing, all of us are in. It, we're in the step process, we work, right? We work. But but the question I want to ask is for us that are looking, we're like, yo, 
I'm getting old. I'm trying to settle down with Habibti. Like, you know, what are the things that you should look for? Because as I mentioned, mm. our culture, and I'm speaking mainly to myself as an American, mm -hmm. we are career oriented. We're very goal oriented. And so you're trying to find somebody who can kind of fit that, that vision of where you're trying to go and what you're trying to do. How, what are some of the guidelines that you should, you know, look at when you're looking for a potential spouse to evolve with and grow with? That's a good question. Well, I, I think the, the first step in the wrong direction is to look for a spouse that is going to align with, you know, the, the direction that your life is going. Mm. Um, when you love someone, or when you're married to someone, you make adjustments, you make sacrifices to mm -hmm. make that work mm -hmm. because the, Love is just a word until somebody comes along and gives it meaning. Ooh. You understand? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to take you to school today. <laughs> oh, hey. so You're you going to learn today. Hey, hey, Jamal, let me get my notepad. Write this down. <laughs> love is just a word until somebody comes along and gives it meaning. Yeah. So you can say, I love you all day long. But what sacrifices? Sacrifices are the proof, the evidence that there is love there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You understand? So mm -hmm. this whole idea that I'm I'm looking for somebody who, you know, their life is going to completely align with the direction that my life is going. That's that's a farce. That's that's mm -hmm. not real. That's not realistic. You know, what I mean, like you're going you're going to find someone and they're going to have their own aspirations. They're going to have their own desires. They're going to have their own you know ambitions and what they want to do in life. And you guys complement each other by making small incremental sacrifices here and there to accommodate each other mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. direction that they want to go. I don't think that two people get married, two people getting married has to stop the direction that they were going in yeah, their yeah. personal uh -huh, lives. Uh -huh. One should actually have nothing to do with the other. I should still be able to be a, a public speaker and travel or whatever the case may be and being married to someone who is, you know, um, an author or a seamstress or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. and And... Our lives should not conflict with that. I should be able to make sacrifices here and there to accommodate you. And vice versa, you should be able to make sacrifices here and there to accommodate me. Even if I don't agree with the direction that you are going. Even if I don't necessarily agree with that. But that's your passion. That's what you love doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because I love you, I love the passion and the energy that you invest in the things that you want to do. Okay. If you like so it, I love I, it. You know what I mean? Like, and mm -hmm. right. If you like it, I love it, and mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I can to accommodate you. Mm -hmm. Yes. That that's what that's what love is about. That's what mm -hmm. marriage is all about. Okay. Um, I do think that you know if you have a particular set of preferences, that you should not marry someone that is going to contradict those preferences. So, for example, mm -hmm. if your preference for marrying a woman is that she wears hijab twenty four seven. Um, meaning, you know, every time she yeah, steps yeah. out of the home, yeah. she the hijab for her is, is a lifestyle. It's yeah, not just exactly. something that she does. Yeah. It's something that she is. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. wears her hijab. Mm -hmm. um, if that's your preference, then I think that you should not risk going in a relationship with someone, you know, who wears the hijab part time under the guise that I'm she eventually she's gonna love me and see how important the hijab is to me and wear it all the time. See, or yeah. I'm gonna force her to wear it because that's my preference. Not because work. that's that's not gonna work. See mm -hmm. and that right there, that's I mean just stop you right there. That right there is really big in the immigrant community. It's like look, you know, I know my daughter's not ready, my son's not married, but if they marry that shiny thing over there, they're gonna change. Her. They're gonna change. Mm -hmm. Like if they marry like my daughter man, she needs to marry a sheikh because that guy he's Marshall, like great in the community That's prays. As soon as he married, you know, like it's That's just real. Farce. As soon as he marries her, she's gonna be on time for prayer, be covering up. This is everything I could have prayed for. That doesn't work, man. That doesn't. I have never seen that work. Mm. And even if, even if a woman somehow, you know, dumps herself down to just accept that and fall in line with that, think about the monster that you are creating. Yeah. That is a monster. That is a monster that you are creating because, uh, as the saying goes, suppression breeds expression. So when you suppress, she suppresses how she feels. Come it's going to express itself in other ways. Yeah, uh, it, has other to, ways. it has to come somewhere else. Absolutely, it's yeah. going to express itself in other ways that she might be the unhealthy. T -t 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 whatever it is, you know, it can be whatever. It, it yeah. could be Twitter fingers. <laughs> listen, I mean, those type of situations can lead to extramarital relationships. Yeah. Those things can lead to, you know, toxic behavior. Mm -hmm. Those things can lead to, you know, psychological and mental breakdowns. Yeah. Yes. You know what I mean? It has to come out somewhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you can't just suppress 
a feeling or emotion and just think that it goes away. It doesn't disappear. Up. Okay, we're good. Right, we're done exactly. Here. You're creating a monster. You know what mm. I mean? So I would say that, you know, for every for every one woman who says she doesn't wear that wear hijab, there are 10 women who say they, they're cool with wearing hijab. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I think that, you know, if you have a list of preferences, then, you know, those preferences, you can meet those. You can find somebody who can match, every, tick every single box that you have. You don't have to force mm-hmm. this particular person or that person to, you know, tick all of your boxes. You, yeah. You're taking their hand with the pin in it and you're checking <laughs> the boxes for them. So, no. so, let me, so let me ask you then, is it, well, I mean, maybe it's a rhetorical question, but is it worth waiting to find that right person that will... Um, not go the same direction as you, but but will tick those boxes that will um, be on that same trajectory that your mm. your mind is thinking. Is it worth that wait? Yes, it is. Okay, mm. it, it is worth that wait because once you finally find that person, like Kalas, you're, you're done. Yeah. I mean, unless you want another wife, that's a that's a whole other narrative. So that's a whole other. You know, <laughs> Let me get some more boxes. Discussion. But if you if you if you if anything that is worth having is worth waiting. For. Yes, that's. You know, anything as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said al wa ta'anni min Allah that you know hastiness is from shaitan mm-hmm. while patience and deliberate you know weighing pros and cons is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. And that's actually something that Allah loves. Mm-hmm. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to one of his companions in the fika khaslataini uh, Allah al Hilmu wa anat. He said, You possess two qualities that Allah loves. Al Hilmu, you're tolerant. Mm-hmm. Well Anat and you you're patient. You're mm-hmm. deliberate mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. your decision making. Mm-hmm. You weigh pros and cons, benefit, detriment before you jump out there to make a decision. That's something that Allah loves. Mm-hmm. So taking your time, being hasty is only going to yield regret in the end. You know, choose now and regret in leisure. Yeah. Choose in haste mm-hmm. and regret in leisure. So right now, two part question. The first question is that um, can you well provide some more context in regards to getting married young? That's the thing we always hear. Mm-hmm. Hey, bro, oh, you brother, you're 25, 20, you're not married. Our religion about married, getting married young, getting married young. So can you provide some context for that? Because our response is always like, when I'm ready, you know. They said, get like, so can you provide some? Well, I think for, for women, women don't necessarily have to get ready. I think most women are pretty much domestic. Mm-hmm. You know, from from youth, from, yeah, from women are a lot ready than guys, a lot quicker. Yes, than they we are. are. <laughs> yes, they are. They mature very much yes, quicker than we do, yeah. and they are domesticated at an early age. They're walking around with their babies in the carriages, and even, got, even if even if, if if it's not their baby, right? You know, you know, they're they're domesticated at at, at early ages. So for them, I think it, it's just. It's not a matter of time. It's a matter of finding the right person. Okay. For them, I think a you know a woman will marry you know as young as she you know feels that she's ready to get married mm-hmm. if she can find the right person. Okay. I think women tend to delay their marriage because they just don't feel that the men that are available you know meet their standards. Come on, man, you know step I mean? it up. <laughs> but for men, for us, we have you know an arrested development. We have you know a prolonged. You know, adolescence. So we are younger, longer than we should be. So mm. we're still 25, 26, 27, playing video games, you know, <laughs> not really into a career, you know what I mean? Just working jobs here and there while 26, 27, a woman is ready to settle down and, you yeah. know, she she's hustling. ready. Right, she's exactly. Working, exactly. college, did a whole bunch of things. <laughs> you know what well, I mean? So um, I, I think for men getting married young, that concept, you know, we have we we've lost that concept. That was something that mm-hmm. during the time of the Prophet Wasallam, the men were prepped at young ages to be husbands. Mm-hmm. Where our our boys today are not prepped to be husbands. They're that's prepped we, to be go the, to college, get a good context. job, and that's they're why. they're prepped to be hustlers. Yeah. You know? They're prepped to be hustlers and yeah. not prepped to be responsible fathers husbands. and husbands. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and that's mm-hmm. part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Um so I think I do think that there is some experience that men need that women don't necessarily need, but mm-hmm. men do need, you know, that experience, that college, maybe if you're going to college or working, you know, settling into a career, learning how to be responsible on your own independently, mm. independent of your parents, mm-hmm. you know, having your, your own home, your own apartment. Paying your rent on time, mm, look, paying all of your mm-hmm. bills. I will say That's this: I, I, I moved into my own place uh, this past December, 
and the is your first place. Yeah, it's my first mm-hmm. place by myself. I, I've always been, you know, kind outside of, of college, outside, outside, of college. Of, outside of college, right? Yeah. And I've always been, you know, independent. But it's a new level of independence because everything is up to you, and and it's not even just about like your bills. It's not just about every, money. Every decision is is every decision, right. and it's your choices that you make absolutely on, on the off, right? Mm-hmm. So like when you're just home, you're like, I could read or I could just go to sleep. You know what I'm saying? I can like, get online, watch porn. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. I can do you know a whole bunch of other things. Exactly. But you ch- you make a conscious decision to do what is going to be beneficial for you. Exactly. So yes, that does come with a level of responsibility yeah. that boys need to have. It is imperative that they have that before they go make a commitment to a woman. Is that, See, because that's, that, that's so tough because Jabril and I was clash on this because culture, my culture. You don't leave the house until you're oh, married. Oh, they build a house on top of the house. Legit, and you, you, <laughs> like, you, you do not leave the house until you're married. So how can you even get all that? You know what I'm saying? How can a wife get independent when they can't even, like, independent man when they can't leave the house because they're taking the care of the mom, their dad, doing all those different yeah, things. That's, you know? that, that can be a bit toxic, man. Yeah, it's, it, it's just a lot. It's yeah, so it's, much. It's, and it's that's so why much. kids, like, young Muslim kids are getting into, like, drugs, like, smoking weed. They need to just, like, all so much stress yeah, on them. Like, early. dude, you're... Whatever, 20 years old, taking care of four kids, making 30, 40, 50 year old uh, decisions. You know what I mean? It's not easy. Yeah, you yeah. Know? It's, so, it's, it's, not, it's not fair either because yeah. they have to grow up quicker than, you know, they yeah. don't even have a chance to, you know, be without responsibility. Oh, the whole life. You know, be a child. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're, they're put into it's almost like what single moms do to their sons. Oh, it's not. You know, this was called, you know, um, emotional incest where the mom begins to the single mom and this is nothing against single mothers i'm just stating what happens yeah. is that sometimes a single mom will begin to engage her son in a man emotionally in a manner that she would love to have engaged the son's father or another man that she was in a relationship so she now makes the child responsible for things for, for those information yeah, that... for her emotions that that child is not equipped to be responsible for Dang, this, dang, you understand? This, she yeah, has a bad day at work. She comes home and she has this conversation with son. her 10, 11 year old son. And, you know, he's not equipped to, to, to tackle that. He's not mm-hmm. equipped. You dumping all of that on him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because there's no man, there's no alternative to that. So mm-hmm. now the son has to assume the responsibility of your boyfriend or your husband. Yeah. You know what I mm-hmm. mean? When mm-hmm. he's not equipped for that. Wow. Yeah. You know, so from an emotional standpoint, a lot of times parents destroy their children. Yeah. You know, they putting responsibilities on them at times in their lives when they should be without that level Respons- of responsibility. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They they have other responsibility, but not that. Not emotional. Not being emotionally responsible for somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, whether it's your mother or your grandmother, whoever, it's just not fair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, children so, need room to make mistakes and yeah. room to, you know, learn and grow from those mistakes before they go into relationships themselves. So what's your advice for those wow. children who are dealing with those toxic relationships with their parents? I mean, if it's from a cultural standpoint, it's really not enough. It's really not a lot that you can do. I mean, what can you do? This is, these are cultural tradition, traditions that yes. have been passed on from generation to generation. Yeah, and yeah. to break that, you know, would mean to create, you know, cultural apostasy. Like, you're going to apostate from your culture. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that comes with serious consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot, believe it or not, a lot of, a lot of youth are not really willing to go that far yeah. to establish their independence. They're not, really, they're not ready mm. to go that whole route. Mm. You know yeah. I mean? Because that, that, that comes with a lot. Yeah. You look at the the story since we're in the the season of Hajj. You look at the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, mm-hmm. and you know him, you know confronting his father about his shirk, yeah, but about his just, idolatry, yeah. Yeah. you know, and and the father says, you know, you know, I'm boycotting you. Stay away from me. Yeah. You know that you know he had to leave. Yeah. He had to leave his father, leave his people leave because his village, he day. took a different route. Mm-hmm. Than the route that his family, his 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 parents, you know, that they took, mm. and that that comes with consequences, you know. So, and you know, the beauty in that is that Allah says that when Ibrahim left his father, we gave him Ishaq. <laughs> you know, when Allah takes something <laughs> yeah. from you, he replaces right away. You know what I mean? So, wow. Subhanallah. So you're right. Like that, you know, parents are raising emotional, you know, sons. Let's say just because all that responsibility or lack of responsibility, right? They live with their family. And so that cooking, boy, when he goes cleaning. into a relationship, what happens to him? Oh, all those responsibilities get thrown on the wife. 
all those so now he takes all of that's important he yeah. takes all of those responsibilities that his mom put on him yep. and he dumps all of them on his wife yeah. or he becomes so emotionally numb that Dang. he's not even emotionally available for his wife wow mm. you understand wow They're both there's actually a book called the Dang. emotionally unavailable man really it's written by a husband and wife christian on one side of the book is called the emotional un, emotionally unavailable man, and then on the other side is the emotionally unavailable woman, and it speaks about this as well. Mm. Damn, that's yeah. a real thing. Yes, wow. that's a real thing, man. And these are things that are not, you know, that are not being spoken about. In, like you're not going to get this information in the massages. Yes. You're going to go to the masjid, you're it's gonna a, sit and listen to the, you know, the the arakana salad, the arakana wudu, <laughs> you know, the thick of this and thick of that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're not going to get this type of discussion, these type of talks. But these things are real. Our children are suffering. Suffering. Young Muslims are suffering. You know. But, you know, we're having a conversation now, so yeah, hopefully, no, you know, is... people will get a hold of this conversation and be able to, you know, relate to it, you know, but mm -hmm. it's important. So so that was the first part question. Second part was that um, people tell you to get married young and you're talking about those boxes, but it takes you a little, like, I'm 27 right now and I just figured out what those boxes were. Mm -hmm. Like, we're talking about, I just... Yeah. Just, you know, alhamdulillah, like, I do a lot of good things. I have my and parents. before you find that someone, you might adjust some of those boxes. Because yeah. the boxes are not finite. You exactly. Know? Yeah. exactly. They're not finite. So it's those non-negotiables that we talk about. But it's like, it took me 27 years. How? There was no way I could have gotten married 10 years ago at 17. There was no boxes. It was just a blank Yeah, but even if you would have gotten married 10 years ago, if you would have gotten married five years ago, uh -huh. um, even if that situation you know crumbled or even if you got separated from that person you would have created boxes because of that experience oh, exactly you learn okay. from it. yeah you're going to learn from that experience and you're going to learn what you don't want you know okay. what i mean mm -hmm. and you're going to learn what you do want which is why the prophet sallallahu said that the woman who's been married previously she has more right to decide who she wants to marry than her father yeah because yeah. she knows what's what because mm -hmm. she knows she's she had knows. that experience yeah, she knows, she, knows. Mm -hmm. she now knows what ticks her boxes yeah. you know yeah. what I mean so yeah. you know don't don't look at it as you know wow you know I'm 27 I just now figured out these boxes it's more like uh, you know what I mean you know as they say you know eventually indecision becomes decision you know, yeah. you know at some point you will yeah. figure it out you have yeah. no other choice but yeah. to figure it out and everybody's on a different timeline too everybody's on a different know? timeline some people get I know people that have been I met a brother that got married at 17 mm -hmm. and he's our age yep. and I know brothers that are 35 that's never been married. Wow. <laughs> I don't know any 35 year old that's never been married. I think I think Jabir just made that up. No, 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 I don't no, know any 35 year old that has never been married. Actually, no, we know we both know this brother. Okay, then don't drop his name. Yes. Yeah. Just shoot me a text. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. It's difficult yeah. out here, man. So let's talk about something you said earlier, uh just uh, pornography, right? Because right. that is something mm -hmm. that you definitely talked about it before, and we talked about it last time when you were at the yeah. um, Thurgood Marshall. Yeah. Right, right, right. Is pornography slowing down people? Is pornography slowing Muslims down from getting married? And what is the take? Like, are, are scholars talking about that? Are they even bringing that up in conversation? Are they kind of hiding it? Because the only person that I've seen talk about pornography was Mufti Mink. And he mm -hmm. had like a two, like at least for me, and it was like a two minute thing, like, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> It is bad news. I actually saw, I saw a flyer recently. I think Yasa yeah, Kladi did a, a lecture or something on pornography or whatever the case may be. I, I mean, I, I can't speak for all lecturers or scholars. I do think that some do, you know, are bold enough to talk about it because it's a touchy so subject. Yeah. I mean, even putting your name on a flyer next to pornography, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, true. that's daunting for a bit. Yeah, you know, yeah, for, yeah, for, yeah. You know, for some, some, of the, some scholars, you know, they might yeah. not even feel comfortable, you know, putting their name on the same Even flyer there. where the word pornography exists mm -hmm. so you know it's a very delicate topic and i just think that sometimes um islamic scholars just don't know how to approach it mm. you know you can't come at pornography from the from the from the angle of it being haram because we all know it's haram yeah. it's not the issue yeah yeah the issue is not that it's haram and i don't think that anyone any muslim who watches it any conscious muslim who watches it uh, except that they know that it's haram. That's yeah. not the issue. Yeah. The, the issue is deeper than that. Why are they watching it? Mm -hmm. Why is there an addiction to it? Is the addiction real? It is. 
Yeah. Like any other addiction, it's real. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why are they watching it? What drove them? What is the why behind it? Mm-hmm. And I just think that Islamic scholars just don't know the entry, the madkhal. Where do I right. enter into this conversation this beast, yeah. where yeah. I can yeah. grab the attention of the youth so that they can understand what I'm saying to them? You know, um, and I mean, you know, um, the going back, for example, to an incident that happened with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a young man came to him and he said, you know, I can do everything that Islam tells me to do. Just give me permission to commit fornication. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> that hadith. Yeah. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how did he handle that? He didn't tell the guy, Astaghfirullah, Udh Billah, that's haram. You yeah. know, he never said any of that. Mm-hmm. He approached it from a different angle where he appealed to the senses the sensical side of that young man. He said to the man, first of all, understanding that it's different between a young teenage boy asking permission to have a girlfriend and an older man asking permission <laughs> yeah, to have yeah. You understand know what I'm saying? Yeah. What I'm saying? Yeah. So you got to look at that. Yeah. Not only that, the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> said that there are three people that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will neither look at them on the Day of Judgment nor will he purify, the, for, purify them from their sins um, nor will he speak to them, and for them is a painful punishment. And from amongst those three is a Sheikh on Zanin, is an older man who still commits fornication. Why? Because as an older man, you should have more self-control. Yeah. So the scholars explain that the desire for you know fornication and to be with the opposite sex is stronger in younger men. Yeah. And should not be something that an older man struggles with. Mm-hmm. So this is why the punishment for him is so severe. And I mean, it's haram for the younger man as well. Yeah. But the hadith concentrates on the lack of maturity of the older man. It's like grow up. That's right, like, exactly. But that's because common sense. that's something that should yeah, yeah, exactly. be common, it's, it's common amongst younger men. Yeah. Yeah. So this young man, so I'm trying to make the connection here that yeah. the young man walked up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked him permission to commit fornication. Yeah. Basically, I can do everything. Just let me have a girlfriend. Let yeah. me sleep with women without any Be- without any commitment. Yeah, commitment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looks at the young man and he asks him, he said, do you have a mother? Mm-hmm. The man said, yes. He said, would you like somebody to commit fornication with your mother? <laughs> the man said, no, no. of course not. Yeah. He said, well, then likewise, people have mothers and they don't want people to sleep with their mothers. Do yeah. you have a sister? He said, yeah. He said, would you like somebody to do that to your sister? All right, so you, you see what I'm saying? The, yes, the yeah. madkhal, the entry, how the prophet approached the situation. Mm. It was just so profound. And I think that in today's time, if you, we're talking to youth who, for example, youth that come from certain cultures where um, it is not characteristic of men to get married in their early 20s. Cultures where men are not even financially independent until they're about 35, 40. Goodness. You understand what I'm saying? What culture yes, is that? this exists. And in many Arab cultures and many Indo Pakistan Arab yeah, cultures, yeah, a that. lot of the men are not financially independent enough to get married, nor mm-hmm. is it the expectation of them to get married mm-hmm. in their early 20s. They're cool. Mm-hmm. So, what are they doing in the meanwhile? I mean, because we're talking about 19, 20, 21, 22, when you're at the pinnacle of your testosterone. Yeah, sheesh. Yeah. If you just sit you understand in the what house, I'm saying? And yeah, all the working the out in the world is not going to help. You can go to the gym. <laughs> Twice a day, you know, you can I need fast. To go back. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can do all of those things, but at some point, those are no longer resources. Yeah, for it don't you. work no more. You know what I mean? So, what do you do in that situation? And what you have to look at when, as it relates to porn, is what it does to you. Yeah. Mm. Watching pornography gives you a heightened sense of sexuality, overstimulates you. To the point where when you finally do get with a woman, you cannot be intimate with her except while you're watching porn. Mm. It gets to that point. Dang. And those are that's more extreme cases. Yeah. But I've counseled couples it where he's watched porn so much, becomes accustomed to it to such a degree that he cannot even get aroused by his wife. Unless they're watching porn. And there's a physical woman in the room right there with him. Wow. You know, so these are the things that, you know, our youth have to understand. And, you know, if you feel that you are and and understand that, you know, I just had this conversation with my son that, you know, what two people are doing on the screen in a pornography movie. That's not love. It's a transaction. Right. That's a transaction. These are sometimes two strangers. Those are actors, though. 
It's in some instances, well, not home videos. These yeah. are actually boyfriend and girlfriend who are just idiots and just upload the video. Yeah. Wow, you know what I mean? Wow. But I'm talking about it's not love. Mm. What you are witnessing is not, as I said to my son, this is not what me and your mom has. Oh, Our yeah. relationship is deeper than that. Yeah. And you don't want them to get confused because yeah. what happens is that yep. teenage yep. boys watch porn and then they get with a girl and they expect the girl to do the things to yep. them that they saw in the porn yep. yeah. video. That's, and it's yeah. like, she's a wife. She's not, she's a Muslim. Yeah. She's a Muslim. She's <laughs> Muslim, not a yeah. porn star. Yep. You, you're yeah. asking her to do all of these weird things with her mouth and do, you know, yeah. like, it's like, no, I'm yeah. not doing that. Yeah. 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 And then that now becomes the expectation. So, I mean, it, 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 you know, not only that, watching porn long enough, it desensitizes the man to the humanness of women. It, so, yeah, every yeah. time you see a woman, mm -hmm. you're concentrating on her backside, concentrating on her you breasts. You can see like a piece of meat, and right. not like a regular exactly. human being having a complete, conversation. Like, complete exploitation. You take from the woman what you need from her. There's no human interaction. There's no love. There's no consideration for emotions. There's n none of that. But the crazy thing that you won't even know, like, is a flick of the switch. It's just yeah. more just like your thoughts come more like, okay, look at her. Right. Rather than the beginning when you're right. like, hey, ma'am, it's nice to meet right. you. Yeah. A woman is standing in front of you and you're untrusting her with your eyes. You don't know how to engage the opposite sex as a human being. Yeah. I, I remember a brother, he asked me, he said, um... You know, how do you, in your line of work as an imam or as a student of knowledge, I'm pretty sure women DM you, things like that. How do you avoid falling into, you know, messing with these women and things like that? I said that you just see them as human beings. Mm -hmm. We just need mm -hmm. help. I, I don't see them. Like, now, mind you, there was a time in my life where I didn't see women yeah. like that yep. there was a time earlier on in my career in my 20s where you know a woman you know shooting you an email it's like yeah she want me you know she know i'm she know i'm that guy i'm that yes. dude you know what i mean you know what i mean like that that's how your mind is yeah. trained to yeah. think that page, any yeah. woman who's reaching out to you and it might be legit she's asking for help yep. yeah or needs exactly. your assistance exactly. yeah. and because your mind goes to the deepest end of toxicity and you know exploitation yeah. you see every woman as an opportunity to satisfy your desires Jeez, damn you know savages savages so imams so, students of knowledge I'm, yeah. any any email a student of knowledge who is honest enough to be you know to have that conversation because we're all human we're all yeah. human is real any imam that sit from a place and tell you he has never experienced that and it has never been with that i, I i'm you know call bs Right, I, I, I seriously <laughs> doubt that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, as, especially in your twenties, when your testosterone level. I mean, I, obviously, in my mid forties now, you know, I'm closer to fifty now. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Your testosterone has calmed down. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. your, your sexuality, your sex drive has start to decline. Yeah. You know what I mean? Women's sex drive increase, men's sex drive decrease as we get older. Right. Yeah, okay. absolutely, Sorry. absolutely. <laughs> Wow. So this is this is why you have a lot of older men who go after younger women. When in fact, if you went after women in your age bracket, you might find them, you know, a little bit more challenging Yo, than you, even some of the younger women. Wow, you, you breaking some some barriers right here. Like this is something <laughs> we, I, I've never in my yes. life heard that. As we get older, wow. women's sex drive increase and men's wow. sex drive decrease. So so for. The guys out there and girls. I, it's what's called the libido. The libido yeah, yeah. increases in women and it decreases in men. Man, so so for the guys and the girls out there that are watching pornography and and you're getting accustomed to it, and even the culture, because you said you know even for you right, like mm -hmm. in the '90s and the '80s before internet, there's still this this culture of we look at the opposite sex like this. That is right. a culture, huh? How do you overcome that? How do you reverse those effects and and see people as humans again and not just transactions well for young men i mean they're still developing you know what i mean mm -hmm. like um young men are very impulsive um we are all born with impulsivity mm -hmm. that's something that we inherited from prophet adam I mm -hmm. adam was hasty allah says well, um, well, insanum in ajal, that the human being was created in haste mm -hmm. and that ayah was in reference to Adam that when Allah created Adam's body it was just a body there with no no soul in it yeah. no spirit 
And then Allah commanded the angel to blow the spirit into Adam. Yeah. And the spirit started from the head, which is ironic because it leaves from the head as well. The soul oh. leaves from the body, which is why the eyes follow the soul out of the yeah, body. Yeah, I've actually right. heard that before. So the soul enters through the top. And as the soul is you know, penetrating the rest of the body, Adam sits up when it gets to his waist. And he looks down at his legs. He's looking at his body. He's ready, he tries to get up, he's ready but he to go. can't. He's, ready, he's right? ready to go. He can't get up because the soul had not finished occupying the whole body. Mm -hmm. And this ayat was in reference to that. The human being was created in haste. So this impulsivity, and this is statistically, human mm -hmm. beings are born impulsive. This is part of that animal, animalistic nature that is part of us. And the impulsivity in human beings do not does not begin to decrease or allow the human being to gain mastery over it until they're around 24 years old. Hmm. And and boys, you know, are obviously slower. So our impulsivity might last until we're about 30. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we're talking about essentially trying to get young men to see girls as human beings. That is not something that we could change in society. That has to be changed at home. Yeah, yourself. first and foremost. You have to be able to train your sons that when you see a woman, you see a human being. Yep. Yeah. Mm. What you see of her breasts, of her behind, her hips, and all of the parts of the body that attract you are there for a reason, to attract you. You understand? Yeah. That's the that's that the the nature of attraction that Allah created us with. How else would we be attracted to the opposite sex except that we have to have certain things that bring us that way? Yeah, yeah. If, they, if they look like us, I'll be I'll stay single. Right. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha she said jamal rijal liha'uhum that the beautification of the men is their beards. So when you think about in the in the animal world, the the lions they have the mane. Oh, on that, the mane. What the bigger the mane, the more attractive he is to the mm -hmm. lioness. Same thing with birds, the Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Again, exactly. Bro. So th th those are th that attraction. So teaching our young men that what you see of her breasts, although attractive, but those breasts serve a greater purpose, purpose than just being looked than at. just being you know breast staring you in your face. Yeah. Um. Those breasts um are going to be there to use to feed your child. Mm -hmm. Those breasts were the same breasts that the milk that came from those breasts is the same milk that attracted Musa. Back to his mother. Well, you understand? Know Musa <laughs> would not feed from anybody else Nobody. unless it was his mother. All right. The the hips of the wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the woman with hips because as she's carrying the child, those hips give her support. You think about a woman, you know, my wife just delivered, you know, just last week. Oh, you know, so when you think about a woman that is carrying a child, you understand? I'm just sitting there as they're prepping her for, you know, for her surgery, and I'm just amazed at the whole entire process mm. you know from from a 40 something year old man you know i've been i had my first child when i was 24 yeah. 25 and now hopefully my last kid you know, <laughs> at 40 something you understand what i'm saying so i've had a period of almost 20 years to observe my wives being pregnant multiple times and you know, finally coming to the realization of how magnificent it's this amazing. process is, man. I'm wow. just observing, like, yeah. from a 40 something year old perspective. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Mm. And, you know, you, you're watching, you know, these women go through this process and you, you develop a greater respect for them. And these are the things that you want your children, your sons to have at an early age. So these are conversations and you find a lot of boys who, you know, are out in the streets and, you know, treat women like trash. Many of them, I would like to say that they don't have fathers in the home. Yeah, or if they do, the father's always working. Or if they, or if they do, the fathers are not there, absentee fathers. Yeah. Or the fathers are just as disrespectful to women as, yeah. as, mm. as, as, the, as the kids are. Yep. Dang. Yeah. You understand? They mm -hmm. see their fathers exploiting women, yep. you know. And that's not to say that, you know, the, the attraction is not there, but we need to make a distinction between, you know, seeing a woman that you are attracted to and, you know, still giving her that respect yeah. and seeing a woman and just looking at just what attracts you to her and seeing her as somebody that you can exploit and take advantage of. Man, this is, this is so important because um, when we just talk to guys, guys always tell women, like, cover up, cover up. Like, all this exposure is making us, like, 
aroused like you said earlier you know what i mean yeah but yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's like guys but when I mean, you but when you look at it from that perspective whether she's covered or she's not covered you should have you, the same attitude you, you have the same attitude and that's and, and that's what i told you both like yo how are some people like yo like i see uh, like your ear showing like is that really getting you all you know what i mean just like the yeah. ear, like the back of the neck like are you like what's really going on in your mind but it's then like, you gotta think that do we over exaggerate that in the muslim community this whole yeah. idea of separation of the sexes yeah. you know um i remember i was just recently at a, um a marriage a marriage retreat that we do you know once every like three or four months oh. and we were in florida and um we had the, the 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 couples we usually let them sit together they're couples yeah you know? and <laughs> so on one occasion we had the the women sitting on one side and the mm -hmm. the, the brothers sitting on the other side yeah. and we were playing a game with them i think i saw the Instagram. and i, yeah. I yeah. right yeah, yeah, and i yeah, posted yeah. the clip and um so one person comments under it and says, you know, I the Bilal, you got the men and women sitting. It's like, first of all, these are adults. These are not children. You know what I mean? First of all, these are adults. These are not children. Second of all, these are married people. Every single person here is Every married. Every person here the is married. The wife is right here. You understand? <laughs> Thirdly, um, this is not the type of environment that breeds that type of, yeah. you know, exactly that type yeah. of mindset. Yeah. Exactly, where somebody's looking at somebody's wife. This it's not that we're at a marriage yeah. retreat. So people, <laughs> these are professionals who paid money <laughs> to come and be a part of this program. These are not just some the, random couples we picked up. These are the paid actors, right? <laughs> exactly. Don't try exactly. this at home. I mean, yeah. No, I, it's just. But you have to think in the Muslim community: Are we over emphasizing so much? The whole idea of separation of sexes and women, you know, cover your ear, your, your your leg is showing. And it's just like, well, if you get an arousal off of seeing a woman's leg, that says a lot about you, yeah, bro. Yeah, you, you have, have no self-control. You're yeah. about as bad as a guy in the hadith. Yeah. And then on top of that, what message are we sending when we tell a woman to cover because of how it is arousing me? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's... So that takes the onus. That takes the responsibility completely off of you off and man. puts it on the woman. Right on them. You know, you it, it, that's, that's interesting because that's the same conversation that we have with, like, the whole rape culture. It's the same thing where they're like, you know, it's a little bit extreme in certain senses where it's like, hey, the woman can dress however she wants. Uh -huh. Don't censor how the woman dresses, right? Well, obviously, in Islam, we have those, those boundaries. Yeah. But it's the same thing. It's like, the men have to, at the end of the day, control their urges, their sensations, yeah. and block that off. And and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did command the men to lower their gaze as well. Yeah, yeah. first. You know what I mean? The yeah. men were told to lower their gaze. So I'm not I'm not justifying a woman you know, not dressing properly, but Absolutely. a woman yeah. not dressing, you know, according to Islamic standards. There's a why behind that. It's not just that she just disobeys a law and she just chooses to not adhere. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like everybody has a different story. Yep. Everybody mm -hmm. has a different narrative, mm -hmm. you know, for why they are where they are as it relates to the hijab. Mm -hmm. However, with men, there is no different story. You are commanded, colon wahid, with one <laughs> command, and that is to lower your gaze yeah. You know? yeah. and to guard your chastity. You know what mm. I mean? And women are, are are obligated to do that as well. But the hijab was not re revealed until the fifth year after hijrah. Yeah. I mean, 13 years in Mecca, five years in Medina, a total of 18 years before Allah commanded the Muslim women to cover. Right. Wow. And everything in the Quran comes like pinpoint like... At a specific it's an time. order for a reason, right? You yeah. feel me? So there's no at mistakes. a particular time. At a particular yeah. time. Exactly. So you were commanded to lower your gates. However, there was a process with the hijab. There was no process in commanding you to lower your gaze. It was just like boom. It was just like do Come, it. Lower yeah. your gaze. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, you know, it's, this is very important that you know, you know, we teach our young men, you know, how to view women and how to look at, you know, how to look at women and how to be respectful of women. You know, because those same body parts that you find so attractive when you finally do get married, you're gonna find that those body parts serve a deeper purpose mm. you know what i mean that that womb you know what i mean in in arabic the word womb comes from the root word of where the word rahma mercy comes from the <laughs> word womb in arabic is rahim rahim so what do you hear in rahim you hear rahim yes. you hear rahman yeah, you hear person. rahma yeah. so this womb you know that is is it's a place of mercy this is where that child that sperm cell is being nurtured being cultivated for a period of nine months and Allah used the womb 
to bring life into the world. Billions. There's of There's a sperm there's a cells. lot right? there's a lot that goes into that because yeah. the same womb is where Allah sends the angel to blow the soul, the spirit into that child. Oh my god. You understand what I'm saying? So when we teach our young boys to look at the woman's body part from these perspectives, then perhaps they'll have a greater deal of respect for yeah, them. That's true mm-hmm. cuz like yo, this is the bigger purpose than you could ever Absolutely. imagine. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes, it's attractive. It's put there for a purpose to attract. As well, yeah. Initially. Initially. But it serves a deeper purpose. Exactly. You know. So, how do parents start to have these conversations with their kids? Because I think the sex talk is... We don't weird. have those talks. I, I think it's deeper than just a sex talk, right? Which you? How, what, what type of conversation is this for the parents to have with their kids? And and I think that conversation is ongoing. Like it's it's yeah, different no, when it's not one time. That, that talk is different when you're ten, eleven, than 15, when you're fifteen, 16, sixteen, and then mm-hmm. even even like for college, because a lot of college kids we experience it. It's a to, it's a total culture shock. Yeah. Even if you're like I'm born and raised here, my family's here, been here. Even college was like whoa, like you know this is different. You're in a new environment. So how should parents approach talking to their kids about these issues, mm-hmm. and how do parents become more aware? Mm. Well, for starters, don't call it the sex talk. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Because <laughs> that, that's the number one turn off to get. Oh, we're having the talk. No, we're not calling Stop. it the talk. The don't label it. <laughs> number one, don't label it. Number two, don't pick a time to have the talk. Just go in. Circumstantial. Mm. If a situation arises where it re- where it requires your parental you know advice about mm. a particular issue or, or or two, then you seize the moment at that moment. You yeah. seize the opportunity at that moment to, to have that discussion. Yeah. But it's not like okay, Muhammad, sit down. We're gonna have the talk. Yeah, it's then, just like yeah, you've yeah, already yeah. boxed yourself out because the child is gonna put up the a wall. wall. The wall goes uh, up. Mom, Dad, <laughs> I'm not having this discussion with you. Yeah. Yeah. But for example, if you are sitting down watching a movie and something pops up or Mm -hmm. you're you're out and about somewhere and you see someone dressed a certain way then that is an opportunity situation arises so the prophet Mm -hmm. sallallahu alayhi wa you know i always go back to his blueprint when you think about how he taught his companions it wasn't formal he didn't have lectures (laughs) sit down on the musalla uh, pull out what 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 you have of the quran and i'm going to give you some tafsir class this morning you know Mm -hmm. he's he didn't teach his companions like that yeah the way he taught was for example him and muad was on the back of a camel yeah just and he says muad do you know the life. right right do everyday you know the life. right of allah over his servants and the right of the servants over allah yeah. you know one day he's with ibn abbas and he says ibn abbas you know i'm going to give you some jewels of advice mm-hmm. you know i'm going to give you some some pieces of advice some jewels of advice just yeah. memorize what i'm going to tell you yeah you know Preserve and protect the rights of Allah and, and the limits set by Allah, and Allah will protect you. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- this is the way that He taught. So it could be a, a simple ride in a car. And say, yeah, hey, exactly. let me yeah. ask you a question. Yeah. You know, and get the person to talk. So I think with parents, you have to be a little bit more strategic in how we approach having those talks. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be so formal. It yeah, doesn't I, have. I think that's what, I mean? what they're scared of. You know, because like even for me growing up, I never had to talk to my parents. Uh, you know, like oh. We had like the FLE, you know, like FLE is like in elementary school. Okay. It, it, they teach it like the sex education class. Okay. And the parents like, oh, your school's teaching that? Well, let them teach you. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can't have that conversation. Yeah. But it's even worse. You don't want to learn it at school because it's just, you get, it's you're no getting guidelines. A of yeah. Information. Boom, it's like being in is. jail and everybody yeah. knows what here they're talking about. Here it is. About. Here's the pictures. Like, like you, you shouldn't even see those pictures like, at that age. Heck? You know? But another thing is that when that comes up, they throw the book at, you know, hey, look, that, that that's haram right there. Don't even come close to that, you know? Yeah. Sometimes, okay, but it's not enough. You know? But I think we, when, when, we talking, when we're talking about sex or we're talking about body parts or we're talking yeah. about the opposite sex, um, using the word haram, is, is it, it turns the conversation into one of shame. Yeah. Mm. So I think when we oh, use the word oh. haram with a lot of our children, shame is associated with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the situation when that we just talked about, when the young man asked the Prophet ﷺ permission to commit fornication, mm-hmm. he never used the word haram. Yeah, he didn't shame him. Yeah. He yeah. didn't shame him for asking the question mm-hmm. that a young man would ask. <laughs> he probably welcomed the fact that you yeah. actually asked Thank me. So you. now it gives yeah. me an opportunity exactly. to have that discussion with you. We have to stop using the language of Islam 
um, in a manner that is shameful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we say, oh, you know, it's haram to look at a woman's chest. It's haram, you know, lower your gaze. It's haram. And it's just like you're shaming him for being a man, for, for, for being a natural. boy, to yeah. do what's natural. The Prophet Wasallam saw a young man looking at another woman. He just took his head and he turned his head like this. <laughs> Turn. Turn yeah. it. You know, it's like you're walking in the mall with your son and you see him glancing over at the girls and you're like, what you looking at? He's like, yeah. no. You know what I mean? Like, you, you got his attention. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you didn't shame him. Yeah. For doing what was natural, what you know, if your boy was not looking at the opposite sex and was looking at the same sex, then you have a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know what I mean. Then you'll be like, so well. you know, the fact that your son is actually looking at girls is like, yes, <laughs> you know what I mean? at least that part is squared away. You know you know mean? At least the rest, right? You know, we'll tweak the rest out. Yeah, at least he's heterosexual. At least he likes yeah. girls. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, and in this day and time, that that's very important. Yeah. With homosexuality on the rise, with lesbianism on the rise, like, mm -hmm. it's very important to make sure that, you know, our children's, you know, understanding of sex and sexuality is aligned with our value system as Muslims. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, know? absolutely. Um, so, we, we kind of want to move away from shaming children. You know, from, you know, seeing things like sometimes, you know, if we're riding on 95 or, you know, there's a particular billboard on 95 coming south um, from North Jersey coming south. There's a billboard. It's been up there for years. And it's like, you know, advertising, you know, um, a gentleman's club. And there's a woman on there with a thong on. And, you know, every time we ride back by there, I can look through my rearview mirror and see my son looking up at the, the billboard. Yeah. And... You don't shame them for doing that. Yeah. You don't say, "A'udhu billah, astaghfirullah." Why mm -hmm. are you looking? Lower your gaze. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're shaming them it's for the crap out of them. Right. You're yeah. shaming them, and then Allah forbid, you know, you attach to that. You know, Allah's going to punish you or mm -hmm. fear Allah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. that—that's even taking it a step further. Yeah. And that cannot be the language. That's not the language of a mature. Parent, yeah, yeah, uh, and, a, and a, a conscious aware, parent, aware, and a, a aware. parent who is aware. Yeah. That's not the language we use. Mm -hmm. We don't shame children no. because what happens when you shame children? Either they shy away from it altogether because they think that it's wrong. So now you create another problem because now they go in the opposite direction. Yeah. Or, um, once they get out of your presence, you know, they just that's it. They're going to do them. Mm -hmm. There's, they're going to do that there's because there's, there's nobody there to shame them anymore. They're going to hide it from you, yeah. which is even worse. There's too. nobody to shame them anymore. So now they close you out and they, you know, continue on down a path that is self-destructive. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so now that we kind of, you know, talked a little bit about, about marriage and pornography, how can we as young Muslims kind of start that process? And how should we approach Muslim women and Muslim men, especially in the age of social media, you know, like was the appropriate way to because we did an episode on shooting into the DMs and I thought we did a pretty good job of saying, look, like go in there respectable. Don't 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 be a creep. You know, yeah. um, there's a right way to do things, a wrong way to do things. Mm -hmm. But in this age of social media, how do we go about it and how, how do we get out of the DMs and like dating and all yeah. that? So like it's so it's, it's so such a wide range of questions right. that we would have but if you could fit that in a nutshell how do we navigate this world of getting to know someone and you know yeah. I think before you slide into anybody's DM you have to ask yourself why are you doing this mm -hmm. mm. are, are you are you ready to get, make a commitment like I asked my son who was about to be 18 the other day I said you know you, you ready you ready for marriage it's like, nah, I'm not ready because he understands marriage is a commitment. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. I'm not ready for a commitment. I said, well, un until you're ready for a commitment, then don't approach it. Mm, yeah. mm. Oh. If you're not ready to be committed to a woman, then don't approach her at all. Because Just, what we end up doing as men is we come in with this false notion of being in a relationship with her, which is not being in a commitment with her. Yeah. A commitment is I'm going to be married to you for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. That's my commitment to you. Nobody else. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that, that I fulfill my part of that commitment. Mm -hmm. That's a commitment. Yeah. Being in a relationship with someone is I, I'm infatuated by you. I think you're cute. You think I'm cute. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do what two people who think each other are cute do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's not a commitment. Yeah. And what you end up doing is stringing a woman along, yep. you know, for some of the best years of her life. Yeah. Ooh. You understand? Stringing her along, she's 20, 21, 22, 23. You don't even you're think stringing, about that. You're stringing her along 
for the best years of her life, usurping, taking away the best years of her life that she could have been giving to someone who was actually committed to her. Or, or working on herself. You know what I'm saying? Or spend that time working with on family herself. Or whatever. And the same thing, mm-hmm. vice versa, with women. Don't slide into somebody DM until you check yourself and say, am I ready to go as far as this relationship is going to go? Meaning, if it's going to lead to marriage, am I ready for a commitment? And if yep. you're not ready for a commitment, then sit your behind down. Yeah. Stay out of the DM. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's just, grown folks business. You know, right. That's grown yeah. folks stuff. <laughs> if you're not ready for that, then <laughs> stay in a child's place. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's number one. Number two is um, I just think that there's an honorable way. As you said, that there's a respectful way to do things. There's mm-hmm. an honorable way to do things. And there's a dishonorable way to do things. Mm-hmm. And if you are a woman approaching a man or if you are a man approaching a woman, you have to put yourself in the same situation the prophet said to that young man. Would you like somebody to do that to your mother? Yeah. Would you like somebody to do that to your sister? You know what I'm saying? Would you like somebody to do that to your daughter? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the same way as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that you approach people with the same behavior that you would like them to approach you with. Mm-hmm. So just like you wouldn't want somebody to do that to you know, a woman in your family, then you shouldn't do that to a woman in somebody else's family. Okay. Yeah. You know, and if you're not serious, then don't entertain. Or even yeah. if someone sends you a DM, hey, how you doing? Salam alaikum, yeah. you know, whatever the case may be, how can I get to know you? Um, no, you can't get to know me. <laughs> No, just shut No, I mean I've I've had people DM me, you know, hey, can can we talk? No, we can't talk. No. And what do you need to know? Oh, yeah, I talked about that last week. <laughs> Go check out my last piece. No, I'm not. You know, it's like, you know what I mean? Like, if you're not willing, if you're not ready, if you're not looking, because some people are only looking for a relationship because somebody is looking for them. What, somebody what, what checking you mean, what you mean. Meaning, you're not looking for a relationship. But if the if a DM slide, you know, somebody slide into your DM, now all of a sudden you're looking for a relationship. You know what I mean? Like, we're not looking for a relationship until somebody's actually checking for us. So it shouldn't be circumstantial. It should no. be when you're... When you're actually ready for it. Nah, man, but you are right, man. It is, it, it is grown folks' business, especially, like, when you approach somebody for the sake of marriage, everything is an intention. Um, do you think it's... If you're serious and it's one of those things where it's, like, after you DM somebody, is it, like, a week later you got to, meet like, meet their parents? Cause I know there's I don't some. No, I'm out of the DM game. Yeah, the DM game. It's just right now. It's like because right. Well, at least at least from our young, a Muslim experience, it's like one of the two things where it's like you know you DM somebody and you start talking for a little bit, then there's somebody else like look, straight up, if you about it, just come to my house, you know, and me, me and my family. It's kind of hard. It's like I don't even know well, anything I, about I think, you. That's I a think, lot. That's, that's pretty hard too. I think women can control. To what extent that situation goes. Okay. Mm. In that, number one, a woman should not be communicating with a man without hawali. Okay. I think if women stuck to that, they could eliminate a lot of the shenanigans. Oh. So, for mm. example, if a man sends her a DM yeah. and her initial response was, if you are checking for marriage mm-hmm. with me, here's my father's number. Give him a call. If he doesn't call, then just block him. There's nothing else Yo, to talk that's about. Wild. You understand? If women use that, you could you could avoid a lot of the shenanigans. I'll be because what happened, at the phone. You're like, what you're doing right now, right? You're, like, you're changing the whole DM game. Like, dude, and listen, dude, I'm, I'm telling you because men men know a, a woman sets the bar. A man will only go as far as the bar that the woman that's true, sets. That's true. That's true. So if a woman he slides into the DM, Salam alaikum, how you doing? Yeah. And she says, Wa alaikum salam, what's your name? And they begin the conversation. You've already cued. You've already signaled to me mm-hmm. that we can do this on our own. Mm. In a woman's mind, she says, Well, I don't need to get my father involved because it's not serious yet. Yep. But when it gets the serious. time that it takes for him to be ser- unserious to serious can be overnight. Instantaneous. Sheesh. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. You don't get to control that. You don't get to say, this is not serious. I don't need to talk to my father about it yeah, yet. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because wow, 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 wow. it can get yeah. serious based upon one text. Yeah. One ex- One exchange can turn a man from I just slide into the I just slid into the DM to see what you what it was all about mm-hmm. to like damn I'm ready to get married. Yeah. This joint seemed like 
Yeah, and she she's ticking all and my boxes. You understand <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, it right, can. Right. I mean, overnight. You right. You don't get to decide. It's not that serious. I'm not. I don't need to talk to my father. You need to. Your father is your first point of communication. You slide into my DM. Here's my father's number. If you're serious about me, give him a call. That message says to that man what? She's. I, I'm, I gotta I'm dead come correct. Serious. I gotta come. I'm dead yeah. serious. I don't play any games. I didn't make that call. And if you don't make blood. the call, then you've proven to me that you're not serious either. Yeah. You understand? <laughs> yeah, no, you're exactly right. Yeah, I mean, you that's... know what I mean? So I think a woman can women control that. Mm -hmm. But when a woman entertains the DM, she doesn't follow the proper Islamic protocol. It it gives the man wiggle room to play games. Even not just with her, because he will automatically assume if she does it. All other Muslim women do it. Ooh, see, they're so, messing us up. Yeah, I know. I see what you're saying. How about yeah. in real life? Now, how about just face just to out, face? Just out and about. Just out and about. Mean? Because like we run into a situation where you might be getting to know somebody just on a friend level, and mm -hmm. once it gets to that point where you're like, I'm kind of developing feelings. Should you, same same protocol? Just hey, look, I kind of like you. Because it, it's more difficult in person. Like because in well, person, thing, in person, I think I think. Boys are naturally intimidated by girls. <laughs> no, 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 hold on. No, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to hear this. I'm trying to hear this. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You have some boys who it's grow up boy. in homes without fathers. I said boys, right? <laughs> Not men. Boys are usually intimidated by girls. Um, usually, I know when I was going to school, Pretty much every girlfriend I had, most of the girls that I had that actually wanted me, you know, mm -hmm. they were women that approached me, mm. not women I approached. Mm. Because the women that I approached, they automatically assumed I just wanted to play games. Yeah. So letting them come to me was the filtering process. That's how I knew who was really serious about being mm. with me and who wasn't. Okay. All right. Because if I approach the girl, she's usually like, "Ah, oh, get out of here. You playing games. You playing, you know, yeah, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to be another serious. girl on your hit list. You know what I mean? <laughs> but when a girl approaches you, she's genuine yeah. because women don't usually do that. Yeah. I when a woman know, approaches yeah. you, she's serious. She she, a woman just, just doesn't do that. At least in my generation. I don't know about today's. Nah, these girls bold nowadays. Yeah, they're, bold. Right? they're a little bold. <laughs> <laughs> they bold um, nowadays. Right? But what I'm saying is that um, even if you see someone. You know, um, I personally would not walk up to a woman and say, hey, you know, I, I would be a little too shy to do that. Mm -hmm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still a new convert at heart. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, as a yeah, new convert, yeah. somebody who converted to Islam. Like, I've, I've, I've only done that maybe twice in my life. And, and both times, the woman was like, I'm not interested in marriage. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. for me, that was like, I, like I, I'm never going to do that again ever in my life. That's not the game plan. Men don't handle rejection well. So <laughs> I'm never going to walk in, up to a sister and anything. say, hey, you married? You looking to get married? Yeah. I, I will never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I might look. And it don't go no further than that. If you don't approach me and say something to me, ain't nothing gonna happen. You know what I, mean? like, I bet. Ain't nothing happening. Okay, got I'm it. not gonna be rejected again. <laughs> but if 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 a man is serious about a woman, then the proper way to approach that is to say, hey, you know, can I? Once you ask for the father's number, the woman automatically knows you're serious. Hmm. When you say, can I have your father's number, your Wali's number, whoever is responsible for you, your mm -hmm. marital affairs, can I have their number? And that, you don't have to say anything else. It's, Even if you saw a, a random sister, you don't have to ask her, is she married or whatever. I mean, obviously, out of respect, if you know, if you don't know her, she's random, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. say, what all due respect, are you married? Yeah. And the woman might say, yes, I'm married, and you just walk away. Yeah. But if you say, you know, what all due respect, are you married? She said, no, I'm not married. Mm -hmm. Can I have your father's number? And believe it or not, you can't imagine how powerful that is because the woman might be like, you know, impressed. Yeah. Like, wow, this dude just walked up to me and asked me for my father's number. That Yo. says to me two things. Number one, that tells the boldness of this man is like he really wants That's me. That's out of his world. And yeah. number two, he's not afraid to follow the proper protocol to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. It's, you know, can I have your father's number? Yeah. Are you married? With all due respect, I don't mean any disrespect. Are you married? No. 
Can I have your father's number? Mm-hmm. I don't need to say nothing else to you because yeah. the person I need to talk to is not you. Yeah. <laughs> I already seen from you what I want. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so those mm-hmm. our business here is done. <laughs> so, do those same rules still apply with a divorced woman? Is it the same same protocol? What do you mean? Um, because you said before that a divorce a divorcee she doesn't have to get the approval from her father, but do you still take? The she same still approval? has to go through the father. She's like, okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. The gotcha, gotcha. Of she has says she has more right to decide who she uh, wants to okay, marry. Okay, gotcha. so meaning the father's influence over who she's going to marry is 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 less. It's less, yeah. Gotcha. When she's been married before, gotcha. as opposed to her being a virgin still, and not knowing, she doesn't know. I still yeah. come correct. Right, the father the father is still involved. Yeah. Whether she's a Happy's number. married before, <laughs> or she's a matron, or she's a virgin, mm-hmm. the father is always involved. He, matter of fact, one of the conditions, the four conditions for marriage, is the presence of the wali. That's the marriage is invalid without a wali. Mm. The, the wali has to be involved. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Ayu ma mura'at nikahat bi ghairi itni waliha, fa nikahu ha batin, nikahu ha batin, wa nikahu ha batin." That any woman who marries without the permission of her wali, then her marriage is invalid. Her marriage is invalid. Yep. Her marriage is invalid. A wali can be a brother. The wali is any male member, biological male member from her family that is Muslim. Her father, her grandfather, her has uncle, to be Muslim. Has to be Muslim. So okay, that's okay. Okay. That's, Man, I don't want to get too like technical with it, but um, because I don't want to like sit forever, and, you know. But but what if she doesn't have Muslim family members? How does that work out? Like if so, if she doesn't have a, she's a convert to Islam and she doesn't have Muslim male family members, then her male members of her family can assist her in that process, but they will not officiate the marriage. The marriage uh, will okay, be officiated okay. by the wali. Okay. But what I have been advocating. For is for convert women to Islam not to just walk into an imam, random imam's office because that puts her at a disadvantage. Number one, Mm -hmm. because if the imam finds her attractive, he's not going to actively pursue marriage for her. Everybody's taken. (laughs) Everybody's taken. Let's talk to everybody. Nobody but me. (laughs) Number two, and and if he wants her, then that's a conflict of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Uh, Because how are you going to be Hawali and you still want to marry her? That's a conflict of interest. Yeah. Number two, um, sometimes a, a non a, a, a new convert to Islam walking into a random imam's office, if depending on how the imam views his responsibility as the imam, mm-hmm. if it's just a job, if it's just employment for him, mm-hmm. then he doesn't really give a damn about helping her. He's yeah, not gonna yeah, he's yeah, not yeah. gonna aid her like he yeah. would do his own biological daughter. Yeah, exactly. you know what I mean, because True his that. whole position as an imam is just an employment. Mm, yeah, he's just an employee. Good point. And that's how he views his position. So mm-hmm. he's obviously not going to exert himself trying to find this woman who's a complete stranger, yeah. a spouse. So walking into Imam's office saying that you're looking for marriage, number one, it makes the woman vulnerable. Number two, um, it subjects her to you know um, unfair you know um, you know practices mm-hmm. because he's not going to exert himself to find someone. Your application will remain on his desk with the. 50 other applications that are there because he's not exerting himself to do that. Yeah. So what a woman can do in that situation if she does not have any Muslim male family members mm-hmm. is that she can allow her the male members of her family to assist her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Meaning that she's not alone with the man. Mm-hmm. You know, your brother, your uncle, your father. And, and as a convert, she should explain to her family. That I cannot Islamically be alone with a man ex- unless one of you guys are there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. And believe it or not, someone might say, "Well, they're non-Muslim, but they still love her. Yeah. Exactly. And they're still, still concerned about her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's just yeah. because they're non-Muslim doesn't mean that they don't care about. Like, if a man is fifty-something years old and his daughter is twenty-something years old, he, this man, has been this woman's father for twenty-something years." You don't think that he loves his daughter more than the imam who just met her, you know, exactly, 15 exactly. minutes ago? We, yeah. we forget that. We take, we take that part out. The imam just met her 15 minutes ago. Mm-hmm. How do you possibly believe that an imam who just met a random new convert to Islam 15, 20 minutes ago, he walked in, she walked into his office, that he mm-hmm. is going to respect her privacy, respect her desire for marriage, you know, honor everything that comes along with that the mm-hmm. way that her own biological father would. Yeah. 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 And I'm not saying that the biological father is going to marry her, but he can assist her in that process. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. 
he knows his daughter. Yeah. He knows what could be good for his daughter and what could potentially be harmful for his daughter mm. better than anybody else. Yeah, exactly. That's true. You know? And so while we, we run with this whole idea, well, they're non Muslim, that don't mean that he doesn't love her. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He loves her more than the Imam who's, you know, obligated to help her. So mm. I think that if a woman is a new convert, she doesn't have any male Muslim family members. She can use the non-Muslim family members to assist her in the process. And when she's ready to get married, she can go to her local imam and mm-hmm. have the imam officiate the marriage. Oh, wow. So, I mean, this is all great information because I know we have people that reach out to us like, hey, I recently converted. Thank you so much for your shows. Great information. So this is something that's really good for the yeah, listeners. So I definitely need it. Thank you. I mean, absolutely. we appreciate everything that you I'm share with us. Um, so um, I guess kind of backtracking to, you know, connecting the dots. So. What are you currently doing now? Like, where are you now and where are you looking to go? That way people um, can, you know, because, you know, I know they want to keep up with your lectures because if you're going to be talking about a lot of more stuff, which you've been talking about now, they definitely want to, you know, exactly. tune in. Well, where I am now, I've kind of like pulled pulled back from the, the mainstream lecture circuit. You know, mm-hmm. I, I kind of privatize a lot of my lectures now. So I kind of work with you know small groups online Mm -hmm. so a lot of my courses a lot of my lectures have now been turned into 10-week courses Mm -hmm. that i that run more like college courses that i teach online strictly um and that's pretty much where i am and anyone who follows me on social media whether instagram or facebook or twitter um you know knows when i put the flyers out or i put links out where they can sign up and register that's usually how i you know function Mm -hmm. Uh, from this at this point I just kind of came to the realization that you know um, I'm not for everybody yeah you know what I mean you gotta be cool with that yeah you know what I mean and I'm I'm good with that usually you know in the past you know you put a flyer out I'm gonna be at this masjid you come there's a big crowd there and you know 70% of the crowd are just there because of the fluff and everything that's you know along with it 10 percent of the crowd are there because they're looking for a spouse <laughs> the other 10 percent of the crowd are there because they really want to learn something yeah. from you you're trying to get and that change. the other 10 percent are there because they want to cause fit waiting for you to say something wrong waiting for you to Ooh, make a mistake yeah, you so they that. can go back Ooh. you understand what i'm saying yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's your breakdown of 100 percent. 70 percent are there just you know because I'm there. That's where everybody else is yeah, at. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, you have 10% that are there that are looking for marriage. 10% that are there that actually want to learn. And then the other 10% of that's there. Your haters. You yeah. know, your detractors that are just waiting for you to make a mistake. And even if you don't make a mistake, they'll make a mistake for you. Yeah. You know, They'll make up a mistake they'll for you. They'll make a story. Yeah. They'll make a story for you. Just, mm. a, you know, overnight fame. You know, yeah. that clout. So, I realized that. The 10% that are actually there to learn is what I want. Let me focus on that. Let me focus on that. Yeah. Right? W.E.B. Du Bois, he wrote a book called The Talented 10. You know, where you take 10% of the most, you know, out of everybody, the most talented 10% of everybody, and you concentrate on that. So I took from that model... And that's what I focus on. Mm-hmm. So when I put my flyer out and I say my course is $250 for a 10-week course, blah, blah, blah. The people who are willing to pay are the 10% that I focus on. Yep. You understand? Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much where I am you know, okay. at this point. Uh, where, do I, where do I see myself or where is this going? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I've always been a drifter. You know, yeah. Wherever the wind blows me, that's where I am. Wherever okay. I'm at, that's where I am. You know, I don't I don't usually make preparations. I have things that I would like to do. I would like to open up a masjid you know, some, sometime. That, that would be the only way that I would be an imam ever or <laughs> would have any affiliation or association with any. You, you, you know, kind of wouldn't have a choice at that point. You're like, well, I kind of yeah. built this place. I mean, if, if, I, if, I, if I built it or if I was the one who established it, then yeah. yes, I have to say so. You know, it gets frustrating when you are collaborating with another organization and you see the organization has potential to do so much better, but they're so content with being where they are. It's yeah. frustrating they don't because want I'm a visionary. Yeah. So I'm looking at the situation. I'm like, we could be doing this. We could be doing that. And then other people are like, no, 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 we're okay where we are. And it's just like, you know what? You take your, you know, take your toys and go over into your corner and I'm just going to keep it moving you know, because <laughs> you're, you're never going to get anywhere. And that many of the massage function like that. As That's long right. as they have their heads above water, they're okay. They believe mm. that they're okay. Meanwhile, Sadly. while your head is above water, your children and the rest of the community are drowning. drowning. <laughs> you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Wow. So, so what, what is one last piece of advice that you want to give to all of our listeners, people that are going to hear this for 
inshallah forever um I don't know. That kind of put me on the spot, man. Yeah, the pre- <laughs> I, I that, mean, that, you that, gotta just let it, let it come natural, man. I, I, I don't usually. Or, or like, what's, like what's a man- what's a mantra that you have that you kind of give out? Like for me, I have a mantra. I know Muhammad has a mantra. What's a mantra what's that, that mantra? you use? A strive to thrive, endure and survive. So we always strive to be better and to progress. Um, and then the hard times we endure it, and inshallah, we always come out a survivor. What's yours? Mine is if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Okay. I'm always planning. Always. Those, those are awesome. <laughs> I, I don't have a mantra that can match <laughs> what you guys have. That's that's Just awesome. Me, it took a long um, time. <laughs> I, I would I would say you know um, allow people to enjoy the best version of you. You know um, something I discussed with my class last night. You know um, self love. When you love yourself, then you position yourself to love other people better. And Ooh. for people to love you better. Mm. So I think, you know, we have to spend a lot more time on working on ourselves. Okay. You know I mean? Self-love equals, you know, loving other people and allowing yourself the ability to love other people. So, you know, working on yourself. And, and this is what I've been focusing on for the longest. We're all work in progress. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, we're all work in progress. And the more you begin working on you, the more you can give other people an opportunity to enjoy the best version of you. Mm. How does that sound? <laughs> I think that sounds like that needs to go on the song. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great signature, a great way to sign off, my brother. Uh, you know, oh, brother Shadid, we really do appreciate you coming yeah, down, absolutely. You know, sit, sitting really down with us. You know, busy, busy, busy yeah. day um, on this beautiful Friday. So we do appreciate everything. I know I. I learned from this conversation. I really do appreciate it. So this thank episode, you. I'm definitely going to listen back uh, to. It's I amazing. Appreciate the the invite, man. And the, any uh, shout outs? Exposure. Um, no, man. Not at all. <laughs> Shout out to God. Shout out Allah's to God. Allah's father. You know what I mean? Allah's great, man. Allah's I mean, great. I mean, the greatest, the yeah, greatest. Absolutely. So, um, where can people find you? Plug it in. What's your Instagram? I know you shared your email courses you know, early. Courses. Where this is the place where uh, everybody well, can everything find is, you. Everything is filtered through my email. You can reach out to me at Imam Shadid Muhammad. I M A M S H A D E E D Muhammad M U H A M M A D at Gmail. Um, my Instagram page, Shadid Muhammad on Instagram, um, Twitter, Shadid underscore M76, Periscope, you know, same, same handle, Mm -hmm. um, Facebook, you know what I mean? Just type in Shadid, I don't, I don't go by any fictitious names or, you know, it's all (laughs) the same, no matter where you hit it, it's all the same. But alhamdulillah, man, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity and I pray that, you know, um, you guys, man, along your journey, I think what you guys are doing is, is awesome, is great, is needed. Yeah. You know, and I pray that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless you and I give mean. you the resources that you need to allow your you know, for your your reach to, to, to go beyond where you are now. You know, just stick Thank with you. it, you know, be Thank patient, you. keep your foot on the pedal, man. Yeah. Just keep going. Now we will, brother. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Right. Um you guys know where all the new listeners, old listeners, you guys know where to find us. Yes. SoundCloud. Um, Apple iTunes, Castbox, the Young and Muslim Podcast.com. Please leave us a review and comment. Let us know how we're doing. That's the only way we'll be able to improve. Um, you know, social media, Young, the letter N, Muslim, that's Young and Muslim. Um, Anywhere that you want to find us Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we are there. Yes, oh, and yeah. YouTube. Make yes. sure you hit that like button and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, so Mo, it's, it's, it's that time. It's about that time. How long have we been on for? For about, you know, about two couple hours two let's stuck around for that long hey man we, hey, we, have, love a, it. we have an awesome <laughs> audience awesome family oh man well listen guys for the last two hours you have been listening to the Young and Muslim Podcast I'm Jabril Salam and Muhammad Hassan and this is <laughs> and we greet you with a grains of peace as-salam wa alaykum <laughs>